God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Whoever believes in the son is not judged, but whoever does not believe has already been judged because he has not believed in God's only son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the darkness. Society is a wave. Anyone who does... The wave moves onward, but the water... Anyone who does evil things hates the light. Not. The same will not, not come to the light. It's such a stupid judgment, in my opinion. I mean, how do you know what it comes to the make up a nation today, next year, God, in their experience... You are only said the evil. One would hardly support such a high as the city of Yet you balance an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so the reliance on government. I'm not good for you, Bella. Don't be ridiculous. I want to sound angry, but it's just not looking like I can listen to you. It's a very bad thing. 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 You to this live debate on does a good God exist? Uh, Prestonwood Baptist Church. Uh, we hope it raises a lot of discussion and a lot of questions. Thank you, Caleb. I'm Dan Panetti, Worldview Director here at Prestonwood Christian Academy. And some people are out there probably going to ask us a question. That is, why in the world are we having this debate in the first place? Well, uh, atheism is one of the fastest growing segments in America. And um, the fact is, we have to be able to engage with those people and, uh, you know, know their sides and know their points of view as well. One of the reasons that we uh, have uh, debates like this is to actually provide uh, training for our students. And uh, Caleb and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, Caleb's dad is actually our football coach as well. And uh, we were just talking about the importance of actually practicing uh, before the big game. And Caleb's a senior and he's going to be at college next year. And we were talking about the importance um, of actually having those practices uh, before he goes out into the world uh, so that we have those, uh, those practices here on our campus. And so, Caleb, tell us a little bit about how important it is to practice uh, and listen to the other worldviews before you actually go out into the society and engage them. Well, uh, I mean, it is a lot like football. And for any of you students out there uh, that do play football or have played football, um, you know, you don't go into a game blind. You have to, uh, first of all, you've got to watch film. You've got to be educated on what the other team or the opposing view would, uh, would do and uh, just their schemes and um, uh, the way they do things. And uh, obviously you practice throughout the week before a game. And uh, that's much like this debate. You know, we're getting, we're getting practice and uh, just different, um, different schemes of our own to uh, be able to uh, counteract those other, the other teams or the other uh, opposing worldviews. Scripture tells us that physical training is of some value, but spiritual training has value not only in this life, but in the next. And so this is part of our spiritual training for our students, our staff, and our parents, and we're glad that you've joined us for this debate. Now, we hope that this debate raises a lot of questions uh, and has a lot of conversation around it. So we've actually produced a discussion guide that you can order online. Um, and, uh, and get for your home or your school as well. So please do that. We hope that you not only enjoy the debate, but enjoy the conversation that stems from it. I know that we've, uh, we've got our speakers coming up. I've got a couple um, just things that we want to go over to make sure you understand uh, the format for today and uh, exactly what uh, your role is as an audience. Uh, we're expecting to hear from, uh, from two uh, wonderful individuals, uh, Dr. Dembski and uh, Christopher Hitchens, and, uh, and we're, we're hoping uh, that we'll get to hear uh, both of their ideas presented and presented fully. And I know that uh, uh, some here uh, may be um, more favored to one side or the other, uh, and I know that uh, you would love to, to clap and cheer and applause, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to do a little golf clap, uh, where it's kind of that nice pol polite clap, but this is not the Happy Gilmore golf audience. Um, so we're going we're gonna to try to refrain from that so that uh, both speakers have an equal opportunity uh, to present their message, because really that's why we invited uh, these two individuals in. Uh, they're, the, uh, they're the two of the premier spokespersons uh, on does God exist and is there a good God? And so we want to make sure that, uh, that we have your full attention and, uh, and we give your full attention to them. Uh, and so um, at the end of the debate, at the very end, uh, when they give their closing remarks, uh, we'll make sure that they feel welcome and uh, they know that we appreciate them so much for giving up their time um, and their talents to come here and spend time with us. But during the debate, uh, if you would with me, uh, just refrain uh, from, uh, from having too much applause or any outburst, and that would, uh, that would be great. What we're going to do is we're going to start out uh, with opening statements from each, uh, with Mr. Hitchens starting, 
Uh, they'll have each uh, 15 minutes uh, to give an opening statement, uh, which actually is a little bit shorter than what they're used to, um, but because we're a little bit younger audience than what they're used to, um, I was just talking to Mr. Hitchens before, and he said, this is a little younger audience uh, than what I'm used to uh, being in front of. He's used to being in front of colleges and adults. And, uh, and I said, well, we're, we're going all the way down to seventh grade, um, and so we wanted to make it a little bit short. And, uh, and I've got ADD as well, so I want to make sure that we kind of keep these things nice and short so I can pay attention as we go. But uh, we'll have 15-minute opening statements, we'll have 10-minute rebuttals, and then we'll have five-minute rebuttal to the rebuttals. We'll have 30 minutes for question and answers. Um, and I need to make sure we understand exactly what we're going to do for this. For the question and answers, there's actually going to be cards uh, in your aisle, okay, little note cards. Uh, and I want you to be thinking during the first opening statements if there's any questions that you'd like to ask uh, either Dr. Dembski or Mr. Hitchens, okay? After they're done with their opening statements, uh, we're going to pause for a second and we're going to start collecting those cards. Um, and we're going to have um, some of our staff go through those cards and try to find um, some great questions, some questions that maybe there's a, a common theme, uh, so we want to make sure that we ask this because there's a lot of people asking that question, um, or this is a really great question, we want to make sure we get that up. Uh, we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A, and what will happen is those cards will come up to me here at the front table, and I'll have an opportunity to just go through the cards uh, and ask our speakers those questions. And after the 30 minutes of questions, which isn't going to be a lot of time for question and answer, um, but it'll be good, but after that, then they'll have five minutes apiece uh, to finish up and give us their closing statements. When that's all said and done, right, it'll seem like the time will go tremendously fast. Uh, but when all that's said and done, that'll be about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, and that'll be enough time, I think, to get out both of these particular uh, views, uh, both of these particular statements. And I think at the end of that, uh, you'll walk away with some stuff to think about. Um, some stuff to be challenged with, uh, and some questions that you might have. And uh, we hope that you take those questions uh, and you search for the answer and you search for the truth. And uh, that would be our great hope, is that you leave here saying, you know what, I need to go find the truth. Um, what, did, what, what somebody said about a particular statement, I want to go see if that's true or not. Uh, the debate doesn't end here. Uh, this is where it starts. So go home. Um, Prestonwood is a great uh, church home. If you don't have one and you want to find a place that... Uh, uh, searches for the truth with you, um, using scripture as our guide. Uh, this is a great place to come, and we invite you to join us here on the, on the next Sunday that we have. And uh, you're more than welcome to be here if you're not a member already. Um, I want to set up the stage a little bit and let you just know who our two speakers are, uh, who our debaters are. And we'll get them up here, and, uh, and then you can uh, um, have an opportunity to hear from them in their opening statements. Um, a lot of you probably know Christopher Hitchens. He is uh, one of the, um, probably uh, the most widely known, uh, and this is controversial writers and critics in the media. Um, he's just a, a tremendous writer. Uh, he's a great wordsmith. Uh, he is uh, fabulous with the pen uh, and is a wonderful presenter with his, uh, with his uh, uh, voice as well. Um, he's probably best known for his work um, here in uh, um, Vanity Fair as well as the Atlantic Month Monthly. Uh, he's a foreign correspondent and uh, uh, has written uh, from more than 60 different countries. He's the only writer to have written since 2000 from Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. He's the author of many books. Uh, one of them, uh, God is Not Great, How Religion Destroys Everything or Poisons Everything. Um, it's probably one of his most popular ones, and he's recently released uh, his memoirs, uh, Hitch 22. He was born in England. Uh, he's educated at both Cambridge and Oxford, um, holds uh, honors degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics. He moved to the United States in 1981 and has worked as a book reviewer, a writer, a commentator, a critic, and a social intellect for many publications. When, you, when he comes up here, please give Christopher Hitchens a warm welcome. To debate Christopher Hitchens, we brought in Dr. Bill Dembski. He was a research uh, professor in philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary right here in Fort Worth, Texas. He directs its Center for Cultural Engagement. He's a senior fellow with the Discovery Institute, uh, their Institute uh, for Science, uh, for Center for uh, Science and Culture in Seattle, and a senior research scientist with the Evolutionary Informa Informatics Lab. He has doctorates in both mathematics and philosophy and has published articles in mathematics, engineering, philosophy, and theology, as well as authored and edited over 20 different books. Um, in his book, The Design Inference, Eliminating Chance Through Small uh, possibilities. It was the first book on intelligent design published by a major university press, and he examined the design argument in a post-Darwinian context. In, 19, in 2009, he published a book on God's goodness titled The End of Christianity, Finding a Good God in an Evil World. He lectures widely on intelligent design and has appeared on numerous radio and television programs, including ABC's Nightline and Jon Stewart's The Daily Show. 
Now, before we bring them up, one other quick thing. I know we have media here. Um, obviously, we have our cameras running. Uh, one of the requests that we'll make to you is that we have no flash photography and that you don't actually videotape this yourself for your own personal use. Uh, we're being webcast live. If you need to see this after, um, it's actually going to be archived on our website at pcawebcast.com, and you can go and you can watch that at a later date. Uh, but for those of you uh, who want to take flash photography, we'd ask you to refrain from that. There'll be plenty of uh, pictures that are taken uh, by the media, and you can see those later. So let's welcome our two guests, Christopher Hitchens and Dr. Bill Dimsky. Thank you for an extremely handsome, generous introduction, during which I began to feel like, as I surveyed the audience also, and having been listening to your music, a bit like a Daniel being introduced to a den of, I'm sure, very charming, <laughs> very charming lion cubs. Um, a different experience from my common one. Let's get straight to it because time presses. Um, there are, I suppose, three forms of the divine, and if you eliminate polytheism, which I think we may as well all do for today's purposes, there are two ways of approaching it. One is the deistic, and one is the theistic. I hope I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but if you don't know it, it's useful, and it's, it's a very important opening distinction. There are those, there have been those, among them were many of the founders of our, of our great republic, um, in particular Mr. Thomas Jefferson, who were not Christians, uh, but who were deists. They believed that the evidence of the universe and of nature showed a designer, seemed to imply it by its patterns and repetitions. Uh, a very, very common um, usage in those days was that of the, the watch. Uh, which later turns up in Mr. Paley's um, Natural Theology, which for many, many years was the central Christian text in the argument for design. He, he says very simply, if you're a, an aborigine and you're walking along a beach and you find a, st uh, a pocket watch ticking away, you don't know what it's for. You have no education that would enable you to judge its purpose, but you can tell it's not a rock, and you can tell it's not a vegetable, and you can tell it's been made by someone for some purpose. That much you must know, even if you know nothing else. The metaphor of the watch was very much used by the deists. And of course, watches run down <clears throat> and break down. And it was believed by many of them that if, uh, if an intelligence had begun the universe, begun the process, he took, took no further interest in it. Didn't intervene in human affairs. Didn't mind who won the war. Didn't mind which country was the leading one. Um, watched with relative, well, or didn't watch uh, with indifference, uh, plague, famine, war, and so forth. Um, that's a very hard position to oppose, by the way. It's quite a, it's, it's very difficult, it's impossible actually to disprove. One can only say the evidence for it isn't quite strong enough to be persuasive. To be a theist, in other words, to occupy the position that many people here currently do, and my opponent does, to be a member of a monotheistic religion, that believes that truth has been revealed, that God has intervened in human affairs, that he has a plan for us, each of us individually, as well as as a species, and that it shows, is a very, very much more difficult undertaking. I'm going to show why I think it's more or less impossible. There are usually three ways in which people try and demonstrate it. One is looking at the cosmos, the vault of heaven, the, the world beyond what we can quite see or apprehend. Um, the second is human history and its development, and the third is our, ourselves, our, our own bodies, our makeup. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I'll have to condense, I hope you'll forgive me, but I'll sketch in what I think the objections are. Um, unless you don't believe, I don't know what they've been teaching you, unless you do not believe in the theory of what is conventionally called now the Big Bang, that our universe is uh, billions of years old and began with a gigantic explosion, you, which is still going on, you are, 
you are forced to be very, very, very modest about what it is you can know about anything. What preoccupies most scientists now is not how much they know compared to 50 years ago, though that is enormous as a difference, but how little they know compared to what they're finding out. All these conclusions are very tentative, but minimally they must involve this. For a few milliseconds, really, of cosmic time, our species has lived on one very, very small rock in a very small solar system that's a part of a fantastically unimportant suburb in one of an uncountable number of galaxies. And that every second since the Big Bang, every single second, um, a star the size of our sun has blown up, gone to nothing, swelled up, shrunk into what's called a dwarf and disappeared. And that the matter of which we are made Cheer up, by the way. You are all made of stardust, which is a, a good way of thinking about yourself. Um, but that's the price of that stardust. And every second I've been speaking, another of those suns has gone out. And indeed, physicists now exist who can tell you the date, more or less the exact one, on which our sun will follow suit. So the, the old um, uh, Christian revivalists who used to stand on the street corner with signs saying, repent, the end of the world is at hand, were in their way right. Uh, we know when it's coming to an end, we know how it will be. But it's, uh, and we know something even more extraordinary, which is that the rate of expansion of this explosion we're living through is actually speeding up. Our universe is flying apart further and faster than we thought it was. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it, and everyone who studies it professionally, finds it impossible to reconcile this extraordinarily destructive, chaotic, self-destructive process, to find in it the finger of God, to find in that the idea of a design. And that's not just because we know so little about it, it's because what we know about it that's essential doesn't seem as if it's the intended result brought about by a divine, benign creator who loves every single one of us living as we do on this tiny rock in this negligible suburb of um, the cosmos. So, again, I, 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 good luck if you want to, but if you're looking for God in the first instance, those are the difficulties you'll have to begin to encounter. If you want to take human history as a vindication, again, I'd urge great caution on you. And I'll take a non-Christian example, if I may, I, though I, I think in all cases it's a big mistake to think that your own cause or your own country or your own side, has God in its corner. For one thing, it commits the sin of pride, which I know you've been warned against, what the Greeks call hubris. Uh, it is probably better, as Abraham Lincoln said, at a time when two sets of Christians were fighting over whether slavery was Christian or not, to decide the future of this union. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was also li likewise not a Christian but a deist, if he was anything, said it might be more useful to find out if we are on God's side than whether he's on ours. But the temptation to enlist the cause of a good God is very strong. Indeed, there are many people in the world today, they're well known as jihadists, Muslim fundamentalists, people who want to kill, really do seriously want and intend to kill everyone in this room, who get the energy they've got and are willing to give their lives because they are so sure that God is with them. And if, so if you want to believe that God intervenes on one side or another and that God takes a hand in human history and human affairs, you have to grant it to them too. I don't know whether you're ready to do that. Or you'd have to say, no, it's only true when we say so, which I think would be, wouldn't it, a rather unsatisfying argument. I'll take the case neither of the Christians nor the Jews but the Muslims. Excuse me, neither the Christians nor the Muslims but the Jews who say they have a covenant with God, whose testament we Christians, Christ, we Western civilization, Christians include in the holy book, uh, those who claim to have met God or as leader met God face to face in the Sinai Peninsula, to have received the law, to have had a direct revelation of morality from him, to have a special covenant. Now, let me just say briefly what, what the problem with that has been for the Jewish religious leadership. Uh, about 10 years before I was born, um, 
about 50 to 60 percent of the Jewish people of Europe were put to death in disgusting ways by mass murder and gassing immolation in Christian Europe in the middle of the 20th century and many people wondered how God could could permit this to a people who he had made a special relationship with and many people left the synagogue as a result they stopped going the Jewish people are in their majority now post-religious secular very largely for this reason and some rabbis were bold enough to say no there is a reason for this you fell away from God and you forgot Israel you forgot Jerusalem it's a punishment for exile it's a punishment for inattention to the covenant many people who've seen their children burned alive uh, said I'm I'm not listening to this I'm I'm leaving I'm leaving the leaving the religion and many rabbis went quiet thinking perhaps they shouldn't come up with any too instant explanation for such a fantastic human disaster and human crime and they waited and then the Israelis won a war in 1967 which got them back control of the holy places in Jerusalem and then the rabbis blew the ram's horn again and said no no we should have waited now we see the finger of God it was all to drive us back to Palestine where we should have always have been and to make us the owners of Jerusalem now we see what the design was well I dare say you read the papers and watch the news there isn't a single Israeli now who isn't wondering whether the victory in that war and the conquest of those holy places wasn't a disaster hasn't led them into a terrible trap of endless war and confrontation um, in the Middle East where their own hubris uh, their own occupation of other people's territory and holy places has led to a terrible impasse there food food I hope at any rate for thought probably the most I can do today is so a little doubt and suggest a bit of reading then our bodies well again I don't know what they've been telling you about Mr. Darwin and about uh, where we come from and our kinship with other animal species but I consider it a fairly settled question that our relation our, our resemblance to other primates isn't exactly accidental it's now um, possible to measure in fact in chromosomes we are perhaps half a chromosome away from the chimpanzee our nearest relative um, all of you when you were being born when you were within your mother's womb grew a coat of hair about four months in and then shed it again you don't need it anymore um, or if you have an appendix that isn't needed any longer for the kind of digestion that you do all of you have the same teeth that's why you have to work on your wisdom teeth so much and other things for the, for the, for the kind of diet other primates used to um, have to live on all of you bear what Charles Darwin himself at the end of Origin of Species calls uh, the unmistakable stamp of your our lowly origin you're a mammal a primate take heart primates can do uh, capable of very great things but we are adapted to an environment the African savanna which we abandoned why did we abandon it because if we didn't abandon it we were going to go extinct there was such a climate crisis in Africa uh, the, all those thousands of years ago that the, the tiny tribe that was then us made the very smart decision to move north and out and away it's it's reckoned by the National Geographic I recommend you look this up that the human species was down to less than two or three thousand people at that point and if it had not made this move would have gone the way of mark this figure would have gone the way of 99.8 percent 99.8 percent of all other species that have ever existed on this planet and gone extinct now I just rub that in once more 99.8 percent of all the forms of life ever to appear on this terrestrial globe are gone wiped out and it was nearly us and it don't, this doesn't to me give the evidence of a design of uh, the finger of a god of any kind let alone one who wishes us well it rather suggests to me that nature and the world are a and human life are a struggle you'll tell me when I've got uh, words you say a minute or two give me a wave I, thank you I didn't I felt I was getting close to trespassing on Dr. Dembski's time um, now it's really, very, it's really worth your time to write off to the National Geographic they'll send you back a kit you scrub the inside of your cheeks put it in a, a solution send it back they will show you a map of where your ancestors came from in Africa and at what time and what route they took to get to where you are now it will be very eye-opening I strongly suggest you do it while I have your attention 
I also suggest on the matter of evolution that you read a book by Dr. Francis Collins called The Language of God. Dr. Collins, as you may know, ran the Human Genome Project, which analyzed our kinship with other animals, and, and we now know the whole extent of our genetic uh, code and ID, including the, the messy gaps in it that are Dr. Dembski's speciality, um, and brought this in ahead of time and under budget, and is the greatest student of DNA and stem cells and all that go with it who we have amongst us. I, I would say the greatest American living physician. I am prejudiced. He's a great friend of mine. He's also been a great help to me in my current illness. Um, he's a great American. He's also a great Christian. That's why I recommend him to you. A very strong and believing Christian. And the chapters in his book, The Language of God, that tell you, don't waste your time not believing in evolution. Don't let anyone tell you it didn't take place. Nice, simple, clear, brilliant chapter is a chapter you are not educated if you have not read. I'll close and say, because I've got only a minute, why wouldn't I believe in this, uh, why, 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 might, why might one not want to believe in it, even if it could be true? Because my view is that it's not only not true, but it's probably a good thing it isn't. Why is it not a good thing? Because I don't think it's healthy for people to want there to be a permanent, unalterable, irremovable authority over them. I don't like the idea of a father who never goes away. And nor do you, if you think about it, when you get closer to parenthood, you won't say to your children, don't worry, I'll never die. You won't be at my funeral, I'll be at yours. I'll be at your grandchildren's funeral. You'll never hear the end of me. That's actually not loving paternity. Uh, the idea of a king who cannot be deposed, very un-American idea as well as a very un undemocratic one. The idea of a judge who doesn't allow a lawyer or a jury or an appeal. This is an appeal to absolutism. It's, it's the part of ourselves that's not so nice, that wants security, that wants certainty, that wants to be taken care of. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the, the human struggle for freedom was against the worst kind of dictatorship of all, the theocracy, the one that claims it has God on its side, the divine right of kings, the feudal system, the monarchical one against which the American Revolution with its secular humanism uh, took place. I believe the totalitarian temptation has to be resisted, and I believe this is one of its core and origin uh, points. And so what I'm inviting you to do is to consider emancipating yourself from the idea that you selfishly are the sole object of all the wonders of the cosmos and of nature, because that's not a humble idea at all. It's a very arrogant one, and there's no evidence for it. You'd do better to emancipate yourself from it and do some real study of, of genetics and biology and cosmology. And then, again, a second emancipation, to think of yourselves as free citizens who are not in thrall to any supernatural, eternal authority, which you will always find is interpreted for you by other mammals who claim to have access and to this authority that gives them special power over you. Don't allow yourselves, don't allow yourselves to have your lives run like that. I've exhausted my time. I'm really grateful for your attention. I can't wait to be back. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. For, uh, for both of our speakers, if this might be helpful to you, over my right shoulder in the back, there should be a countdown clock. Uh, that you'll see counting down for you. I don't know if you can see that or not. I'll give you a couple minutes warning because I can see the clock here in front of me as well. So, Dr. Dembski. Good morning. Thanks for this opportunity to be here. I'm grateful to Christopher Hitchens and to Prestonwood for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna, I want to address uh, first the existence of God and then in my next 10 minutes address the goodness of God. Uh, the, the existence of God is really the way to your question. Once that's settled, the goodness of God follows, I would say, straightforwardly. Although I could rehearse standard arguments for God's existence, I want in this debate to take a different tack. Christopher Hitchens disbelieves in God's existence. Why? Lack of evidence and evils perpetrated in the name of religion, he says. But his book, God is Not Great, reveals a more basic reason. Hitchens, as a scientific reductionist, believes science has given us new knowledge and that it destroys religious faith. 
What is this new knowledge? According to Hitchens, it is Darwinian evolution. You may ask what a chapter on evolution is doing in a book defending atheism. At the end of that chapter, Hitchens explains, quote, we no longer have any need of a God to explain what is no longer mysterious. Let this sink in. Religion, according to Hitchens, renders biological origins mysterious. But now that Darwin has come and shown how natural selection explains biological origins, all is clear. Fellow atheist Richard Dawkins put it more memorably. Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It's no coincidence that Richard Dawkins, the world's best known atheist, is also an evolutionary biologist. Atheists, like everyone else, need a creation story. Without God in the picture, something like Darwinian evolution has to be true. And so Hitchens, though a humanities guy, lectures his readers on proofs of evolution. Let's look at a few of these proofs as he gives them. One, junk DNA. If Darwin got it right, then our genes are cobbled together over a long evolutionary history accumulating lots of useless DNA, junk, because it's easier for natural selection to keep copying junk than, rather than editing it out. This sounds plausible, but it is subject to experimental test. In fact, recent findings show that much of this so-called junk DNA regulates gene expression. This is true even of repetitive DNA, the quintessential DNA junk. A forthcoming book titled The Myth of Junk DNA details these findings. Two, the Cambrian explosion. This refers to a narrow slice of the fossil record in which the main animal body plans appear suddenly without any precursors. The Cambrian explosion was a mystery in Darwin's day, and it remains a mystery to this day. Paleontologist Peter Ward writes about the Cambrian explosion as follows, quote, the seemingly sudden appearance of skeletonized life has been one of the most perplexing puzzles of the fossil record. How is it that animals as complex as trilobites and brachiopods could spring forth so suddenly, completely formed without a trace of their ancestors in the underlying strata? If ever there was evidence suggesting divine creation, surely the Precambrian and Cambrian transition, known from numerous locations across the face of the earth, is it. Now Ward, like Hitchens, is an atheist. So he tries to soften this statement later, but the mystery remains. For more on the Cambrian explosion, see my book, The Design of Life. Third point, the inverted retina. Vertebrate eyes have nerve cells in front of the light-sensitive retinal cells. This means that light first has to pass through a barrier before being detected. This seems counterintuitive, but there are good functional reasons for it. A visual system needs three things, speed, resolution, and above all, sensitivity. If the eye isn't sensing light, it's useless. Now, it turns out that the light-sensitive cells are the most oxygen-greedy cells of all cells. And they get their oxygen from blood. The sensitivity here is truly astounding. Some frog eyes can sense the smallest unit of light, a single photon. Positioning the nerves in front of the light-sensitive retinal cells ensures maximal blood supply to the retina and thus maximal sensitivity. But the story gets better. In 2007, it was reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that Miller glial cells, these are the little cells, the fat cells that coat the, uh, the nerves, act as optical fibers conveying light to the retina. As the abstract in the article notes, quote, Par their parallel array in the retina is reminiscent of fiber optic plates used for low distortion image transfer. Thus, Miller cells seem to mediate the image transfer through the vertebrate retina with minimal distortion and low loss. This finding elucidates a fundamental feature of the inverted retina as an optical system and ascribes a new function to the glial cells. So the vertebrate eye is much more sophisticated than Darwinists on their low expectations of design suspected. And thanks to these Miller glial cells, the eye's re resolution is magnificent. This is, this is completely unexpected. The problems with Hitchens' proofs of evolution don't end here. All his proofs are easily deconstructed. I'm happy to do so during the Q&A, and I have his book with me. Hitchens is obsessed with the human eye, the same eye that has allowed him to read and educate himself as an atheist. Observing different types of eyes in nature, he repeats the chestnut that natural selection gradually has turned a light-sensitive spot into a full-fledged camera eye. No mention that eyes have to be built in embryological development, or that eyes are only as good as their associated neural processing. 
No details from about the genetic changes that would be needed to affect such a transformation. And it's not just that Hitchens doesn't provide that, nobody provides that when they tell these just-so stories about how, how the eye evolved. But to really make his case, Hitchens cites Dan Nilsson and Susan Pelger's mathematical, eye, evol, mathematical model of eye evolution, which he claims shows that eyes could evolve in a geological instant. Let me tell you a secret about mathematical models and computer simulations. Unless you tether them to real observable processes, you can use them to prove anything, in which case they prove nothing. The model of Nilsson and Pelger, which Hitchens praises loudly, is of this sort. I can write a computer program that evolves Richard Nixon into Christopher Hitchens, the scary thought. Such simu simulations prove absolutely nothing. I know what you're all thinking. Since the evidence for evolution is so underwhelming, and since Hitchens has hitched his wagon to evolution, shouldn't he now be ready to abandon evolution and consider the existence of God? Yet this is precisely what he will not do. His atheism demands a materialistic form of evolution, and there's only one going theory of it, namely Darwinism. The alternative, which places us here as the result of design, is for him a non-starter. It's unthinkable. In regarding design as unthinkable, Hitchens puts himself in an atheist straitjacket. For the atheist, we must be here as the result of a blind, purposeless evolutionary process. There are no other options. Atheism demands evolution. Okay, it's not that evolution forces you to be an atheist, but if you are an atheist, that is your only option. For the theist, on the other hand, it's possible that God used an evolutionary process to deposit us here. But it's also possible that God deposited us, deposited us here in ways that make our design evident. Either of these are live options for the theist, and the theist can consider them fairly. Atheism, however, cannot live without Darwin. Hitchens needs evolution to be true. His treatment of it is therefore calm and deferential, albeit mistaken. By contrast, his treatment of theology and biblical studies is boorish and obtuse. For instance, Hitchens dismisses Israel's time in Egypt and Sinai as myths lacking all archaeological evidence. Yet that evidence is readily available. Take, for instance, James Hofmeyer's books on the topic, published by that flaming fundamentalist publisher, Oxford University Press. Or consider Hitchens' view of Jesus. There is, according to him, quote, little or no evidence for the desire, for little or no evidence for the life of Jesus, close quote. Come again? It's one thing to deny the miracles attributed to Jesus, but to say, as Hitchens does, that Jesus is, quote, not a historical figure, close quote, is contrary in silliness. For all his talk about freedom of inquiry and enlightenment rationality, Hitchens exhibits a very selective concern for truth. What seems to matter most to him is not whether a claim is true, but whether it makes a good stick to beat religion. Deny that Jesus was real? If it helps advance the atheist agenda, go for it, especially since it's easy to get away with this in an age of theological illiteracy. Whenever Hitchens invokes science against religion, one gets the impression that a juggernaut is rushing forward, crushing everything in its path. Science advances, religion retreats. This is wishful thinking. Fact is, as any historian of science understands, science is not a cumulative enterprise. So reversals, retractions, and revolutions play as much a role in science as insights, illuminations, and intellectual breakthroughs. Thus, new scientific advances, far from undercutting religion, can in fact overturn anti-theistic conclusions derived from prior scientific mistakes. Chemical evolution is a case in point. Chemical evolution attempts to describe how non-living chemicals arrange themselves into first life. Atheism requires that chemicals have this ability. Darwin attempted to strengthen the atheist's hand by arguing that first life was so simple it required no designer. Darwin's argument, made in a letter to Joseph Hooker, has since shown itself to be a failed argument from ignorance. Precisely because of what Darwin didn't know about the complexity of the cell, microscopy being quite limited in the 1800s, he thought the cell was so simple that it could easily self-assemble from ordinary non-living matter. Now, I point out to you that these arguments from ignorance uh, charges apply both ways. I mean, it's possible to argue from ignorance for design, but it's possible also to argue for, from ignorance uh, for non-design. 
The revolution in molecular biology of the last 50 years has given the lie to this misconception about chemical evolution. We know, we now know that every cell in all life is composed of cells as a vastly complicated assembly of interconnected technologies that argue for intelligent design. We need to be engineers to understand what's inside the cell. And the level of engineering we find there far exceeds anything humans have invented. There's a whole field of engineering called biomimetics, where you look to the engineering that we find in living things and then use that to invent technologies for our use and pleasure. Now, if you want to see this, just the complexity of the cell, I urge you to get your PDA, call up YouTube, and punch in, quote, inner life of the cell. And I actually, I won't, my feelings won't be hurt if you do that right now while I drone on here. Uh, I just mentioned that what for Hitchens is a dirty word, intelligent design. For Hitchens, intelligent design, or ID as it's now uh, abbreviated, is just rebranded creationism. It is religion and not science. But in fact, intelligent design covers a broad range of special sciences, including forensic science, archaeology, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. Intelligent design, by definition, is the study of patterns in nature that are best explained as the product of intelligence. Let me give that to you again. The study of patterns in nature that are best explained as the product of intelligence. It is a basic feature of human rationality to identify the products of intelligence and distinguish them from the products of natural forces. Okay, even our language draws that distinction. Was it the result of intention, purpose, design, intelligence? Was it the result of chance, accident, randomness, noise, necessity, chance, necessity? We draw, this is a fundamental way we have of making sense of the world. So, and many special sciences capitalize on this distinction. They would not be possible without it. In 1998, I published a, st a statistical monograph with Cambridge University Press. It was titled The Design Inference, and uh, Dan Panetti kindly mentioned that book. In it, I laid out a probabilistic method for drawing this distinction between design and accident. Essentially, this method triangulates on design by identifying independently given patterns, known as specifications, that are complex in the sense of being hard to reproduce by chance. And we see this in many, many different contexts. Uh, uh, you may have seen the movie Contact, for instance, which came out the summer of 1997, but it was based on a novel by Carl Sagan, in which you have these SETI researchers, these extraterrestrial intelligence researchers, are looking for signs of intelligence from outer space. And what convinces them that they've come across an intelligence from outer space? It's not that little green men come to Earth and then we can do experiments on them. It's just that we get these radio signals. What would tell us that a radio signal is the result of intelligence as opposed to the result of random radio noise? That's a scientific question, and it's one that intelligent po design poses. In fact, it's at the center of intelligent design. So to, dis to dismiss it as rebranded creationism, I think, really misses the point. Anyway, if you saw that movie, there's a moment at which contact is made, where the alien intelligences have made themselves evident, and it's when the radio astronomers find a long sequence of prime numbers. Uh, no, these prime numbers are mathematically salient. They're specified, and they're also complex. It's a long sequence of prime numbers. It's not just uh, prime numbers are numbers divisible by themselves in ones, so it's not just two, three, end of story. You know? I mean, if you're monitoring millions of radio channels, you'll find a very brief sequence of prime numbers. But a long sequence, well, that's not going to happen by chance. And this is, this is I mean, we, we know this. Highly improbable events happen all the time, but if that event also matches a given pattern, a specified a specification, then we know, ah, we're dealing with design. All the mystery novels, all the cases of forensic science depend on this sort of drawing this inference. Did this person die by foul play? That would be design. Or did they die by natural causes? That would be non-design. OK, so this method then identifies what I call specified complexity. In the design inference, I showed how this method applies outside biology. By the way, when I did this outside biology, I was in good shape. People were writing all sorts of nice things about my work. Once I applied it in biology, though, uh, my career went down the toilet, and I can no longer get a job in the mainstream academic world. Uh, 
And you can, you can actually look at this. Uh, I mean, there, there are wonderful endorsements on the back of, this, this, of my book, uh, which have been pulled in the paperback edition. And in fact, one of the best endorsements by philosopher of biology, Bill Wimsatt at University of Chicago, who was at my dissertation defense when I did that book, um, or did the dissertation, because it was based on a philosophy dissertation. Um, he is, in a subsequent blurb on the back of a book, he says, this book completely deconstructs Dembski, who's trying to take science back to the Middle Ages. Okay, that's 10 years later. So actually, I think my work has gotten better over the years, but, um, uh, but this, is, this is how it goes. I mean, ideology infects this debate. And it's, and it's, and it's a religion, if you will, it, it, the, the same motions are at play which Christopher Hitchens invades against in the religious world, I find in the academic world. Maybe we can talk about that at some point. Anyway. Uh, I better get back to my prepared remarks here. Uh, in the design inference, I showed how this method applies outside biology. Subsequent work, I showed how it applies in biology. We found that Darwinian evolution came up short and that ample evidence uh, of design is found there. For a nice summary of this work, I would refer you to Stephen Meyer's book, uh, Signature in the Cell, or my book, The Design of Life, which I think may be out there for sale. Just as getting from Darwinian evolution to atheism is not a big stretch, so getting from design and biology to theism is not a big stretch. We, are we therefore ready to agree that God exists now? That we have seen Richard uh, Hitchens' proofs of evolution fail the intelligent, and the intelligent design alternative succeed? And that his critiques of theology are self-serving? By itself, my argument establishes a designer behind the universe, a Kantian architect, if you will. For the purposes of this debate, however, I think we're pretty close uh, to closing escrow. Note that the full positive case for God's existence can and should be fleshed out. Typically, such a case flows from critical reflection on the big questions of life. Why is there something rather than nothing? Where did we come from? Where are we going? Why should we take morality seriously? Why is the world comprehensible to our minds? Why does mathematics, presumably a human invention, have such a precise purchase on physical reality? Each of these questions can, in my view, be answered better within a theistic and than an atheistic worldview. And then there are the specific historical questions. Did Jesus really live at all? Which Christopher Hitchens seems to doubt. Did he resurrect from the dead? What is the evidence for that? Uh, if somebody raised from the dead, then it seems uh, that there might be good evidence for the existence of a theistic uh, deity. Uh, so all of those are uh, questions we could raise, uh, and I would raise them and uh, address them uh, if time permitted. But I'm, as I said, I'm taking a particular tack. Uh, Christopher Hitchens looks at, makes his case for atheism by looking to Darwinism. He needs that, and so I've focused on deconstructing that. Uh, the, and let me say this also: uh, intelligent design is a scientific program, but it has theological implications. That said, evolution in the sense of a purely materialistic form of evolution, the type of evolution that Darwin came up with, also has implications. And I would say they are theological implications. They're anti-theological implications, but anti-theological implications are theological implications. Uh, when Stephen Jay Gould, for instance, who in his time was the best known evolutionist this side of the Atlantic, remarked in his book, Ever Since Darwin, Ever Since Darwin, we know that we were not created in the image of a benevolent God. How does he know that? That's a theological claim. Uh, so intelligent design is friendly to theism in a way that evolution is not. And as I said, if you are an atheist, you must be an evolutionist. The implication runs from atheism to evolution. It does not run from evolution to atheism. Uh, it may be that God has just set up the world to, to evolve that way. That would be an option for a deity. Uh, but if you are an atheist, you must go with evolution. And a blind, purposeless form of it, one where you don't see any evidence of design. So that's uh, where I'm going to leave uh, the discussion about God's existence. I haven't taken you, I haven't argued for the full-blown deity, but I've gotten you at least into the ballpark of a deity. And so that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dembski. We're going to go ahead and uh, actually pick up cards for those of you who uh, would like to ask a question. If you could pass those cards 
Um, to the aisles, we'll have some people around to, uh, to pick up those cards, and uh, those cards will make their way up to me uh, after we hear the rebuttals from, uh, from each of our speakers. So, uh, Mr. Hitchens, 10 minutes for a rebuttal. I'll try and do in less if I can, because I'd rather reserve time for questions if possible. But um, yes, after all, I've been challenged on a number of fronts, and uh, that's what I enjoy. Um, I, I was trying to think of something that I agreed with. Um, but I, I found I had to disagree almost ab initio, as it were. Um, an atheist does not have to be an evolutionist. Atheism long predates the discoveries. Atheism long predates the revolutionary discoveries of Charles Darwin. Um, there was a time when the word scientist didn't exist. Actually, the word scientist is a late 19th century coinage, though I sometimes feel we could do without. In the, um, in the time of Sir Isaac Newton, for example, people who did the work of the sort that he did were called natural philosophers. And I think that it's important to realize that science is not just the study of the material world um, or, or, or laboratories. I mean, after all, Einstein, um, Sir Isaac Newton may have been a very, very, very great scientist, but he, he maintained a furnace in his room in Cambridge at all times because he was also an alchemist and believed he would one day find out how to turn base metals into gold. He's one of a long line of people who were genius uh, crackpots. Um, he believed, for example, that the Pope was the Antichrist. Maybe it's true. Um, uh, and that the, if you could find the measurements of the old temple, that would be far more useful than knowing what the measurements of gravity were. But he was a, a natural scientist. He knew absolutely nothing about evolution. Um, the work of Spinoza, the work of Voltaire, I'm trying, the work of Lucretius, admittedly Lucretius did work out Democritus and Epicurus as well at that period of the Hellenistic period. They did work out the world was made of atoms. I, a very brilliant thing for them to have done at the time. But the mystery to me is only this, uh, because none of these things necessarily depend on one another why it is that organized religion has always been so hostile to discoveries of this sort, why it should take them so personally. The work of Lucretius, De Rerum Naturum, that uh, established that we're made of atoms, and so is the rest of the, of, the, of the system, was hated by the church for centuries. Only about one or two copies of it were allowed to survive. They didn't want you to know this. As you know, the church didn't want Galileo to look through a tube and see would make the disconcerting discovery that the sun doesn't go around us, we go around the sun. I presume now no one is going to give me an argument about that today. Why would anyone care which way it worked? Well, because if we don't go around, if the sun doesn't go around us, we're not the center of the universe, which makes it, doesn't it, fractionally less likely that we're the objects of the whole thing. If we revolve around something else, it could be we're not the sole object of a huge cosmic divine design. So what I've been trying to attack today, and I've given no reason to want to attack it less, is this reassuring idea that it's all about us, this solipsistic, selfish, I think, unscientific idea. The work of Darwin and later of innumerable uh, uh, writers, many of whom are Christian, on evolution, shows that there's absolutely no necessity at all for an incompatibility between a private belief in God and a recognition that we arose out of natural selection and random mutation. Let me just take the question of the eye. Uh, I think Dr. Dembski said I was obsessed with it. That's absolutely not true. It's simply that Darwin himself doubted at first that the eye could have evolved given its complexity. And because the eye is the example most commonly brought up, so I thought, okay, in my book, I'll take the most complex and the most difficult and the most well-known example. And you can look at my book, or you can look at a very brilliant chapter in Richard Dawkins' book, Climbing Mount Improbable, beautiful short chapter on the 25 different evolutions of, of the eye and the different ways in which it's taken place. I have contributed to this because I'm not a scientist. Only one small thing, but I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. You may have seen, you should have seen, a wonderful series made by the British Broadcasting Corporation called Planet Earth. It's the greatest photography of the natural world you'll ever see. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, and in one very fascinating case, they, they go to Indonesia 
and which has the largest caves we know underground on Earth, which have a whole series of life forms inside them, many of them not fully understood or explored yet, including a large number of life forms that we do already understand that fell in to those caves when they were formed and ceased to live on the Earth's surface and in the sunlight and started to make their lives underground. They are, they're, they are more or less exactly the same as they would be if they, rem they had remained where they were. But I noticed the salamander, the beautiful Indonesian lizard. Everyone's seen one in a zoo. There it was. It had been living for, David Attenborough told us in the program, X millions of years away from the sunlight in a cave. It had eyes. <coughs> no, it didn't. <coughs> It had perfectly eye-shaped indentations, exactly where the eyes used to be, like a little sketch or outline of an eye, but no socket. The socket had gone, the eye itself had gone. All you could see was the vestigial. It had adapted. It had decided to lose its eye. Most of our studies are about how people got hold of eyes. Dawkins's is the best one, whatever Mr. Dembski may, Dr. Dembski may say, of the different ways in which different creatures got different eyes. But no one until your humble servant, because I, I wrote off to my friends and my enemies and said, has anyone noticed this before, had thought, now how do animals lose their eyes? The same way they got them, by not needing them anymore, by adapting away. If you live underground, in the wet, in the dark, it's a big hazard to your survival to have a wet, useless spot that can't receive any light, two of them on your face. It can pick up infection, it can make you vulnerable. You lose it. It takes millions of years, but you'll lose it. That's what we're talking about adaptability. Wrongly it's said that Darwin talked of the survival of the fittest. People draw often cruel and inhuman conclusions from this and attribute it to Darwin. Didn't say anything of the sort. What he said is adaptability is what helps survival. If I told you that in parts of Africa where elephants are shot for their tusks, elephants are growing shorter tusks in reaction, you would, I'm sure, laugh. How would the elephant know how to do that? Elephant sees hunter, works out hunter wants tusk, is an ivory hunter, shrinks tusks to minimize chance of being shot. Don't be ridiculous. Well, no, that isn't, of course, what happens. What happens is the ones with long tusks get shot quite a lot. And the ones with shorter or no tusks have, therefore, greatly enhanced opportunities of being the ones who survive and breed. And their descendants actually have shorter or no tusks. That's what adaptability is. That's what evolution is. It's not some kind of trick. Um, in the time I've got, that's the best I can do on those points, on that point, because I want to come in what remains to me to the uh, allegations made about my, um, my theology. Well, the archaeologists of the State of Israel, after the 1967 war, when Israel became, for many years, the possessor of the Sinai Peninsula, it's now given it back, and of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, the biblical territories, had an unprecedented opportunity to show that the Bible story was archaeologically provable. And they were told by the founding leader of the State of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, go out, dig, find, he said, dig up the title deeds of our state. They had the strongest motive and the greatest opportunity any archaeologists have ever had. And the standard of Israeli archaeology is already extremely high, as you can tell from their national museums and the work of many great archaeologists, such as Professor Finkelstein. And they had many years to do it. They couldn't find a single trace of anything that was remotely compatible with the story of the Exodus, the wandering, and the conquest of Canaan. Not one trace. On the other hand, what they could find with the help of Egyptian archives was enormous evidence in the opposite direction. Uh, Digging Up History is the book. It's very easy to get, very easy to read. It's a very impressive demonstration of what I call, and this is what to look for when you're looking for intellectual honesty in life, evidence against interest. In other words, people will, will, will say, I really wished, I really hoped I could find this. This was my ambition. Here is how it wasn't compatible, wasn't doable in the light of the facts. I regard that as a very impressive piece of objective work on the part of Israeli scholarship. If, um, 
if you think um, that Jesus isn't a historical figure, it really only matters to you. Um, I, what do I mean by that? For me, the most important thinker is Socrates, and the most important source of morality and philosophical comfort, by far. There's no evidence that Socrates existed either. It's not conclusive. That's to say, we only have, as we have in the case of Jesus, uh, second-hand eyewitness reports of him. They're pretty persuasive, but they're not conclusive. Um, he never wrote anything down, neither did Jesus. Um, the stories about him are, f are much more compatible than the ones of Jesus. The four Gospels contradict each other about everything from his birth, uh, the circumstances of it, uh, the flight into Egypt, uh, the, uh, cru very crucially, in all four cases, on the crucifixion and the resurrection. That all of the, just re read them for yourselves. I'm sure you must have read them by now. The discrepancies are extraordinary. They, couldn't, they, they don't amount to a historical figure in the same way as we know from coinage, from building, from parchments, not parchments, but from documents, tablets, uh, things, that Alexander the Great, for example, was a historical figure. But to me, if Socrates didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. Because we have his method, we have his teaching, and he teaches us what, this is, I loop back now to Dr. Dembski's first element of his critique, to uh, having to know that to be educated is to understand how little you know and how little you understand. Dr. Dembski seems to think he's laid some kind of gigantic egg that's about to hatch a huge squawking chicken when he points out that among evolutionists and among uh, physicists and, and others, there are huge differences and disagreements. That's true. It's also going to get much, much more intense. If you want to see a really strong argument take place, Go and talk to Richard Dawkins and ask him about his view of Stephen Jay Gould's, another great paleontologist, arguments on punctuated evolution. There are tremendous differences within our school. There's a huge amount yet to be known or explained. Uh, but we don't take anything on faith. There's no dogma. There are no tablets. We go where the evidence leads us. And, for example, when the last outbreak of uh, flu virus occurred, because we have now, we know something about the genetic things we have in common with bacteria and viruses, and we were able to sequence the DNA of the last such virus in 1919, didn't take us very long to get a vaccine that could prevent the last flu from being as bad as the previous one. It works. It works. You can make sound medical predictions based on it. Medicine's impossible without the work of, of evolution and genetics. And you should be grateful for it. But it doesn't mean there's no God. It just means that we have what we think are better explanations for our human nature. Um, I think that runs me out perfectly. It does. And again, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dempsey. Very good. Uh, the topic of this debate is the, on the existence and goodness of God, and I, I want to focus on these ne in this next 10 minutes on the goodness of God, arguing for that. But um, I, I do want to just say a few things about um, some of the comments uh, that uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens just made. Uh, the, the claim that atheism predates evolution. I mean, it's certainly true that atheism uh, predates Darwin's theory of evolution, but uh, the idea that nature, the material world, is all there is, uh, that there is no, there are no gods, no transcendent intelligence, nothing beyond this material world, uh, that is an old notion, and those notions often have, I mean, if, you, if that's all you've got, nature basically has to do its own creating, its own self-organizing. And it's not surprising, then, that in the materialist philosophers of old, uh, Christopher mentions uh, Lucretius, for instance, you have a prototype of Darwinian evolution of natural selection in his De Rerum Natura. I mean, I, I, I read this with my students. Uh, so you evolutionary ideas go back a long way. They don't take precisely the form of, of Darwinism, but if you are a, an atheist, uh, that's really the only game in town. Matter, the natural world, has to organize itself. And if you look at the old creation myths, uh, Enuma Elish, uh, the, the Greek creation myths, Hesiod's Theogony, what you find are natural forces, the cosmic egg, the 
waters, Tiamat and Apsu, sweet and salt waters in the uh, Babylonian uh, mythology, and they organize themselves, and then finally at the end you get Marduk, uh, the, the, the prince of the gods. So you go from simplicity to complexity, and that's always the direction of evolution. Now it's interesting, uh, he brings up vestigiality, the cave fish. It's a very different thing losing an eye and gaining an eye. I mean, if you have an eye, you go put the fish in a, in a cave, you have these cave fish, and all you need to do is disable some gene or some promoter or something, and the eye is gone, and, doesn't, and it's not needed. Evolution doesn't have to try to get it back because it's, it's gone and it's not needed. But getting the eye in the first place, that's the problem. That's where the design comes in. Uh, Christopher mentions the appendix. Actually, the appendix has a use. I mean, it's, it's recently been found that it's a repositor of, uh, of these, uh, these probiotics. And it's, uh, it's been implicated in the immune system. I mean, that's been known actually for, for a number of years. But uh, so whenever you ascribe vestigiality, you are in danger of making an argument from ignorance because it may be that some use ends up being found. Although I would admit that in, with the cave fish that that's not going to happen. Um, uh, you know, the claim that medicine would be impossible without evolution, what are we talking about? I mean, nobody in the intelligent design community doubts that Darwin, uh, let me put it positively, everybody accepts that Darwin got something right. The, the point is, how big of a picture, how much did he get right? Uh, natural selection certainly operates. It explains how uh, bacteria will gain antibiotic resistance, how insects will get insecticide resistance, but it doesn't explain how you get bacteria or insects in the first place. And that's the big claim. That's the whopper that we are being asked to believe on materialist grounds. And there's no evidence for that. Small-scale evolutionary change is no problem. They can follow Darwinian patterns. Uh, we accept that. But this is always a problem in science where you take a theory get a good idea and then you try to totalize it and apply it to everything and what you find is that usually after time you find that the scope of the theory needs to be contracted and that there is a proper range of applicability of the theory and that's I think what we found with Darwin. So uh, Darwin was a great scientist, I don't want to mean to take anything away from him but he, this totalization of Darwin uh, has continued and you know to mention Stephen Jay Gould and, and Richard Dawkins, when you, if you read uh, Stephen Jay Gould's great tome at the end, this 1,400-page brontosaurus of a book on this, the, the structure of evolution, what you find is that he, in the end, capitulates to Darwin, that Darwin got it basically right. Punctuated equilibrium is just a, a, a slight modification. It's not a revolution within Darwinian thinking. So I could go on about this, but I, I do want to address the, the goodness of God, since that is also a stated topic of the debate. So last time I argued that God exists, the next order of business is to establish God's goodness. It's here that Hitchens mounts his loudest attack against religious people and against God himself. His motto in such attacks is, heads I win, tails you lose. Thus, if religious people behave badly, that counts against God. On the other hand, if they behave well, that means nothing, because non-religious people can behave well also. In establishing God's goodness, let's therefore first level the playing field. The 6th century Christian philosopher Boethius helps us here. In his Consolation of Philosophy, Boethius states the following paradox. If God exists, whence evil? But whence good if God does not exist? Boethius contrasts the problem that evil poses for theism with the problem that good poses for atheism. The problem of good does not receive nearly as much attention as the problem of evil, but it is the more basic problem. That's because evil always presupposes a good that has been subverted or corrupted. All our words for evil make this plain. The New Testament word for sin, Greek hamartia, presupposes a target that's been missed. Deviation presupposes a way, a via, Latin via, from which we've departed. Injustice presupposes justice, and so on. So let's ask, who's got the worst problem, the theist or the atheist? Start with the theist. God is the source of all being and purpose. Given God's existence, what sense does it make to deny God's goodness? None. Indeed, denying God's goodness is logically and rationally incoherent. It's absurd. To see this, consider what it would mean to assert that God is not good. Presumably, this would mean that God violated some moral standard. Whose moral standard? One devised by Christopher Hitchens? God owes Hitchens nothing. Nor does he owe us any. He owes us nothing either. I want to add that. 
To say that God is not good must therefore mean that God has violated an objective moral standard. But since God is the source of all being and purpose, any such objective moral standard cannot reside outside God. Such a standard must therefore derive from God himself. But in that case, how can God violate it? God himself is the standard then. God's goodness follows as a matter of definition once God's existence is taken for granted. This may seem like a cheat, but it's not. The problem of evil still confronts theists, though not as a logical or philosophical problem, but instead as a psychological or existential one. The problem of evil can therefore be reformulated as the following argument. Since God is good, he wants to destroy evil. Since God is all-powerful, he can destroy evil. Evil is not yet destroyed. Therefore, God will eventually destroy evil. As time-bound creatures, our problem here is with the word eventually. We want to see evil destroyed now. And because we don't see it destroyed now, and thus experience the suffering that evil invariably inflicts, we are tempted to doubt God's existence and goodness. Our challenge, therefore, is to continue trusting God until evil is destroyed. Hitchens' long litany of evils, especially those committed in the name of religion, is designed to derail our trust in God's goodness by getting us to think that if God really were good, he would have taken care of evil by now. now I, I want to just go back because I think I, uh, I wasn't quite as clear as I want, wanted to be. In terms of God's goodness, it seems either we are going to have to admit that God is the standard because everything follows from him, or we're going to have to refer the goodness to some subjective standard of some creature, but that God himself is not going to be bound by that. That cannot be the standard of goodness, ultimately. So, yes, I, I would argue, and I have argued, that once you have God, it really is incoherent to affirm that God isn't good. But, as I said, there's still a problem when we have to deal with evil in the world. And I'm leaving this argument at a pretty general philosophical level. I mean, we, I'm not, you know, the, the, the debate topic, I'm trying to stay with this, is the existence and goodness of God. And I'm taking God very generically. I'm not getting into specifics of Christian theology. I'm treating this more as a question in philosophy of religion. Okay. So, we have now uh, the, this, the, uh, uh, the, the, the existential problem of evil. Uh, God's goodness in the face of the world's evil is, as Boethius noted, a problem. It's not an insuperable problem, but neither is it a trivial one. By contrast, the problem of good in the face of God's non-existence, the other half of Boethius's paradox, is, I submit, insuperable. The problem of good as it faces the atheists is this. And I, you need to pay close attention here. Nature, which is nuts and bolts reality for the atheist, has no values and thus can offer no grounding for good and evil. As 19th century free thinker Robert Greene Ingersoll used to say, in nature there are neither rewards nor punishments, there are only consequences. By the way, my dad was a biologist, he taught evolutionary biology, and this was one of his favorite expressions growing up. Uh, so. uh, but uh, this, uh, Ingersoll made this comment in the 19th century. Uh, more recently, Richard Dawkins has made the same point. Quote, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Close quote. Values on the atheist view are subjective and contingent. They reflect inclinations to behave and feel in certain ways given the conditions of survival and reproduction under which our ancestors evolved and the social conditions under which we've been reared. Hitchens speaks of moral values as being innate and waxes indignant when they are violated. But on atheist principles, what is the force of morality and what justifies such indignation? Hitchens, for instance, is incensed with religious communities that practice female genital mutilation. So am I. But without an objective moral standard, which atheism cannot deliver, Hitchens himself is at bottom a complicated piece of matter that evolutionary and social conditioning have inclined to react in certain ways to certain behaviors. In particular, he reacts quite negatively to this practice. But religious communities that engage in this practice are quite content to continue it. Moreover, on atheistic principles, they have the better argument, for they are surviving and reproducing quite nicely, indeed out-reproducing the secular West. 
On atheist principles, morality is, as Michael Ruse and E.O. Wilson note, an illusion fobbed off by our genes to get us to cooperate. This statement by Ruse and Wilson is very widely quoted, but too often the punchline gets omitted. Let me read you the punchline. This comes at the end of that passage. Morality or ethics is illusory. Okay, they've just said that it's an illusion. It's illusory, but why? Inasmuch as it persuades us that it has an objective reference. That's the punchline. See, for morality to work, it has to convince us that there's an objective reference. Because if we realize that it's just bunk, then we're not going to do it. We have to be deluded into thinking that there is an objective moral standard to which we have to bow down. And as long as we're deluded in that way, then we can be moral. So this is, this is their point. That's the kicker. Christopher Hitchens is morally earnest. So is the female genital mutilation community. Try to convince either that they're wrong and get into the fight of your life. But their passionate moral convictions on atheist principles merely show that they fooled themselves into thinking that morality is objective and universally binding. No, on atheist principles, all that's going on is one group of material objects. Enlightenment rationalists like Christopher Hitchens are inclined to one set of behaviors and another group of material objects, female genital mutilators, inclined to another set of behaviors. Just to be clear, and I'm going to go over just a moment, I think I went under the last time, I'm not saying that atheists can't act morally or have moral knowledge. But when I ascribe virtue to an atheist, it's as a theist who sees atheists as conforming to objective moral standards. The atheist, by contrast, has no such basis for morality, and yet all moral judgments require a basis for morality, some standard of right and wrong. So the atheist is cheating whenever he makes a moral judgment, acting as though it has an objective reference when it does not. But perhaps such cheating is inconsequential. The American pragmatist philosopher C.S. Peirce held that for a difference to be a difference, it has to make a difference. Christopher Hitchens claims that atheists can behave just as morally as theists. In fact, he claims that they will behave better than theists because religion poisons everything. At the end of his book, he therefore poses the following question. Name an ethical statement or action made or performed by a person of faith that could not have been made or performed by a non-believer. I have since asked this question at every stop and haven't yet had a reply. Close quote. But Hitchens has posed the wrong question. Since God exists and has created us, we all have moral knowledge built into us by God and thus are capable of performing the same ethical actions. Hitchens' question therefore answers itself. A far more interesting question would have been, given a moral action, what is the profile of those who engage or refrain in engaging in it? And do religious as well as anti-religious factors play a significant role here? Consider eugenics, euthanasia, and abortion. Those who oppose these actions are largely people of faith. They see humanity as made in God's image and therefore human life is sacred. Accordingly, it would be a profanation for them to engage in these acts. Conversely, those who embrace these actions are largely anti-religious secularists. They see humans as evolved mammals, pieces of complicated matter in motion with no transcendent value. Obviously then, theism and atheism have profoundly different moral consequences. Here's a difference that makes a difference. At the heart of this difference is the existence and goodness of God. And for that last thing on eugenics and euthanasia and abortion, I would refer you to John West's book, Darwin Day in America. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Demsky. Christopher, you have five minutes. Five minutes, on, <clears throat> five minutes on the goodness of God. Um, okay, never one to refuse a challenge. I, I don't really know what it's like being a, a Christian, but I've, it seems to me that if I was one, there are, there are reasons I would want to object to the Dembski view. First, I think, this, this attempt to prove the existence of God by what we would normally call something like scientific evidence, um, which is a, a restless need that the religious have, I think partly because we keep taunting them with not ever coming up with enough conclusive evidence, so they keep coming up with more. I mean, after all, the Big Bang was actually originally thought of by a, a, a Catholic priest in holy orders at the University of Louvain in Belgium, and he took it to the Pope. Uh, Pope Leo, I think it was, who said, well, if you like, I'll make it official dogma. I'll say that Christians have to believe it. And uh, the professor said, well, no, Your Holiness, that's not quite what I mean. But very often when, 
not in this case, but when something marvelous and various and, and awe-inspiring, like the theory of evolution or the theory of the Big Bang, is finally accepted by most, if not all, people, Christians simply say, well, that just proves God is even more ingenious than we thought. He must be responsible for all that, too. Please always beware of an argument that, that appears to explain everything. It's very likely to explain nothing. But there's another reason why I think I would be um, a little uneasy at arguments of this kind that try and wrench evidence into, into theological shape. Where, this is my question for you to ponder, where's the need for faith in that case? If it can be proved in the same way as a proposition of mine has to be proved or has to fall, what need for faith? What need for the suffering, the struggle to achieve faith and maintain it? There'd be no need for faith if there really was evidence, would there? I don't see, I'd, be, I'd love to know how you bridge this gap. Perhaps someone in the question period will, will um, supply me with a, a, a thought there. And then another reason why I would steer very clear of this idea of making God responsible, not just for our existence, but for our behavior and for, and for what happens to us, is it dooms you to have to keep on pestering him with plaintive questions that don't have an answer. Final, I have found a complete point of agreement with Dr. Dembski. It's absolutely true. If I was a Christian, I would not think that God owed me an explanation. There'd be something disproportionate, surely, about that, something conceited. But people do find themselves asking, if there's a God and if he's good, where is all this evil from? This is a strictly time-wasting question. Things like war and pestilence come because we are not very highly evolved animals who live on a rather climatically unstable planet and don't know very much yet about our circumstances. The way that we behave to each other is recognizable from the way that other animals behave to each other, unfortunately, but we have one very clear idea, and it's fortunately one that it's almost impossible for us to get rid of, that if we don't act responsibly to one another, whether for altruistic reasons or not, the motives don't necessarily have to be pure. But if we didn't have a social dimension, a bonding one, uh, we wouldn't survive. We'd have gone by now. We wouldn't have made it out of Africa. The question, in a sense, answers itself. Now, you can call this morality if you want, and there certainly are some individuals who act in what appears to us to be a self-sacrificing way. And they've always got tremendous honor in all, in all tribes, in all societies, in all, and at all times. But it's only really necessary to recognize that we have a kinship and a solidarity and that without it we're, we're gone. Morality cannot be dictated to us. It doesn't come in tablet form that can be swallowed. It comes from the Socratic method of moral suasion, long reflection. Why should this be called wrong? Why would this be a dishonor? Um, otherwise, why do the Ten Commandments say nothing about slavery, nothing about genocide, nothing about child abuse, nothing about innumerable other things that preoccupy us and make us think, of which we think as evil, and about four instructions on how to worship a very jealous, capricious, and ill-tempered God. How come? If you, if you based your morality on these tablets, you'd be missing an enormous amount of what we think of as morally urgent. Now again, I happen to be a secular humanist. I have politics of my own, fairly accurately described by Dr. Dembski. That doesn't go to the question of whether there's a God or not. You can be a supporter of um, Ayn Rand. I'm sure some of you have read. Uh, the Fountainhead, or The Virtue of Selfishness, one of her best essays, actually, um, though I don't agree with it, uh, or Atlas Shrugged, had complete contempt for religion, but politics completely different from me. You can be an atheist and a sadist. You can be an atheist and a fascist. Most fascists, actually, were Roman Catholics. Doesn't matter. You can be an, an atheist fascist. Mussolini, I think, was an atheist. Uh, quite rare. Um, to be a, a communist, a Stalinist, it's almost a necessity to be an atheist. Um, there are as many choices as you like. All we say is there's no supernatural dimension, there's no rescue coming to us from the unseen, there's no such thing as salvation, um, and we are 
as alone as other species are um, in, this, in this struggle. So looking at the clock and realizing I've run it out. Um, can I just then uh, have you view that as a, a prod to the question period? I'd be very grateful if you'd be that generous. Thank you. Okay. Let me, uh, I'm going to focus more on the scientific questions because that's really where I've been punching away. I think, uh, as, I, as I said, I think uh, from looking at Christopher Hitchens' book, it seems that ultimately the question of science and that science has given us new knowledge has been at the, the center of uh, his justification of atheism insofar as he justifies it. Uh, so I want to look at a few of the, the scientific uh, issues that, that he has, has raised, which I've not yet uh, discussed. Uh, one thing that he keeps bringing up is this uh, Copernican or super Copernican principle, the idea that uh, Copernicus displaced us from the center of the universe. Uh, that uh, we had been at, on earth and then everything, the heavens were going around the earth and when that happened that somehow we had uh, a pride and we knew that we were at the center of God's attentions and then somehow when uh, that changed, when Copernicus put us revolving around the sun, then somehow our place was, uh, was minimized and then as we found that the, the heavens and are much bigger than we ever suspected, our place has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And uh, Carl Sagan referred to the, the pale blue dot, that our planet is a little dot and that, uh, that there's uh, really nothing uh, there, uh, that, uh, that we're very insignificant because of our uh, small place in the cosmos. Now it's interesting, uh, if you look at the ancients, when they looked at, saw the humans at, on earth as at the center of things, they did not regard this as a place of privilege. Uh, the earth in this ancient conception was a place of decay, corruption. Motions were straight because motions would come to an end. The, the heavens around them, that was the place of eternity. And in fact, God was thought to, to reside beyond these heavens that were circling the earth. So my point is just that the, we, we thought that the, uh, we had this privileged, the, the, the common conception is that we had this privileged place, but actually the ancients didn't see it as a privileged place at all. They saw the privileged place as way beyond the, the heavens. So, yeah. Christians did that. Well, it was it was the ancients. I mean, this 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 is Aristotle, Ptolemy, and all this, and the, the Christians took but it I'm over. I'm not arguing with them. I'm arguing okay. with you. Okay. <laughs> all right. But the, uh, the, the I, I the, agree the, with the, them. But, okay. But the the point is that uh, that what is what determines our significance. I mean, Pascal said, "By in size, the heavens swallow me up, but with my mind, I comprehend the heavens." It seems that our intelligence, our language, the things that distinguish us from uh, the other animals. That's what puts us in a privileged position. I mean, I think was it, uh, I mean, if size is a question of value in, in the ultimate scheme of things, I think G.K. Chesterton put it, then, uh, then humans sh should have thought less of themselves because of the nearest tree. Uh, so th my point is just that this principle has been used by atheists as a club to try to get us to think less of ourselves, to think that human ex exceptionalism doesn't hold. And this is a big theme in the atheist-theist discussion, trying to minimize the place of humanity and it has great moral consequences because if we don't see ourselves as made in God's image, as exceptional, not in a prideful sense, but exceptional in the sense that we are made in God's image, then, that humans have a special place in the scheme of things, then I think you do very easily run into eugenics, euthanasia, abortion, things like that. So it is a significant point. Uh, let me uh, address just uh, another issue, which is uh, what, what of faith if we've got all this overwhelming evidence for design? I mean, usually uh, the argument is made that the evidence for evolution is overwhelming. By the way, I got so tired of it that I finally bought the domain name overwhelmingevidence.com, and I also own the domain name underwhelmingevidence.com, at least I used to. So, but the thing is, what, what of it? I mean, Design takes you only so far. I mean, uh, 
I, I know that uh, I've watched a few debates with Christopher Hitchens, and he, he knows about uh, Kant's first critique and the, uh, the whole point that the design argument, the teleological argument, does not get you to the, the Christian God or to a transcendent creator. It gets you to an architect of the world. Now, that gets you in the right ballpark, but design gets you only so far. So, so uh, getting, having intelligent design is not a proof of the Christian God. It doesn't get you the gospel. It does not get you the tomb. It does not get you the resurrection. Intelligent design is not the gospel. So, I mean, and people, I mean, atheism has remains to this day a minority position, but was much more a minority position, I would say, in the ancient world, where most people were polytheists, a few monotheists. Uh, but atheism in the developed sense of the, uh, let's say, the Greek uh, atomist philosophers, uh, that was, has been a very small minority position. So, uh, so what are we to say that uh, you know, people believed in, in, go in gods or the gods? But you know, that's the, but the, the, the evidence from science, it seems, takes you in the right direction, but it does not, uh, in, in terms of the, the Christian faith, which is what uh, I think where, where Christopher has his sights uh, set, uh, it's not going to lead you into the kingdom. So I, I, I just don't see why, you know, the, 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 this worry that somehow intelligent design is going to make faith. Uh, I would also point out that, I mean, in Romans uh, 120, it said that from the, by looking at the physical world, the attributes that we can clearly understand that God has made the world. And so that, that was just common coin for, for Paul the Apostle and for many people that, yes, the world did give signs of intelligence, but still, that didn't get you the faith that, that the, the Christians, uh, Christians had. Okay, um, uh, enough said. Well, could I just say, yeah, in, in fact, I mean, it by, I mean it by way of applause that I mean I think it's remarkable for Dr. Dembski to say that his scientific work doesn't have and isn't supposed to have any Christian implications. I think that's a great gen generous admission well, on your part. Well, but it's, it does get you in the right direction. It's friendly. I would say intelligent design is friendly to Christian theism in a way that Darwinian evolution never was and never was intended to be. I mean, if you look at Darwin toward the end of his life, uh, he was a, con a strong agnostic in the sense that no knowledge of any god was possible at all. Yeah. All right. So, well, we've okay. got some time for uh, questions that we'd love for you guys to respond to. And <laughs> Uh, what we'd like to add, too, if, uh, if you have one question for each other at the end, based on what, uh, the responses that you'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hitchens or you'd like to ask Dr. Dembski, uh, we'll save time for that as well. The first question, uh, and these are for both of you to respond to, um, obviously they're kind of pointed towards one person or the other, uh, but the first one is uh, for uh, Mr. Hitchens, um, using the evolutionary process, where do you, and, and you answered this a little bit, but if you could expound on it, um, where does the concept of human thought and the ability to reason come in, especially in dealing with things that would seem to go against um, the, uh, the evolutionary concept, um, the idea you mentioned before was self-sacrifice. Why would there continue to be something like self-sacrifice if that's not going to, um, you know, continue to move on the species? So where does that idea, the ability to reason, come from using evolution? Well, it seemed, I, mean, I think the question may be confusing the idea of reasoning with the idea of self-sacrifice, which isn't necessarily an irrational one. Um, my favorite example, I think, would be um, because we do, we do, we do need a, a, an explanation, or it would be nice to have one. It's a good speculation. Why do people get pleasure from doing things that aren't necessarily in their interest, just for the sake of other people? I hope no one in this room hasn't had that feeling at a certain point. Um, and it's, it's very nice that we have it along with all our predatory and selfish and other survival necessary attributes. I think my favorite example is that of giving blood. Um, I like giving blood. Um, I like the feeling that I'm giving someone else a life-giving fluid. I am giving it. Uh, I'm also not losing it. It doesn't take very long to replenish a pint of blood. So it's, it's a really wonderful gift relationship to have. You haven't lost a pint, but you've given one. Um, so there's no need for any sort of feel good or self congratulation about it. You haven't really made a big sacrifice, but you've taken a little time. You've thought about other people. 
And then I have a very, very rare blood group, um, and I'm very anxious that there be enough blood when it's my turn. So there's every interest in the good feeling that I have, the warm feeling that I have, being one that evolution has given me for my sake and for everybody else's. I don't think there's anything very mysterious about that, do you? Apparently not. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't require... It doesn't require that I have a divine spark. It doesn't require any design. It doesn't require any programming. And I'm perfectly aware of the fact that a lot of people don't do it. Don't. And, of course, there are a lot of people who, are, who don't care about others at all. We call them sociopaths. And the design apparently also makes quite a lot of psychopaths, people who can only be happy, making other people unhappy. These are all children of God as well, according to you. It's not my problem. That's exactly what you would expect from the imperfectly evolved primate species. No mysteries there. Nothing to explain, nothing to call on God about. Why did you allow Hitler? We know where Hitler comes from. There's no, don't, a real, a, a, the principle of Occam's razor in, in logic and philosophy. Keep it by you at all times. Don't make mysteries where none exist. Don't increase the number of unnecessary and complex questions. Very important principle. It's death to religion, that principle. Would you like to respond to that as well? Maybe just a follow-up. I mean, it's, it's certainly a big theme, both here and in uh, Christopher Hitchens' book, this idea of bonding, that, that evolution has uh, given us some sort of group solidarity, makes us bond, and that this, uh, that this helps preserve the, the species. So, it's, uh, uh, so it all kind of matches up. And I think, I think there's, uh, you can get that from evolution. I, I don't think you need to get it exclusively from evolution. I think certainly one can argue on basis of design that God has designed us to be social creatures. But the thing is, if you're going to take the bonding from evolution, it seems that there are lots of other things that you can take as well. I mean, uh, Darwin referred to evolution, the evolutionary process, as the great battle for life. And some people have taken it in a very uh, negative and violent way. Uh, there were uh, two authors uh, recently that wrote a book on the evolutionary history of rape and argued that rape is an evolutionary adaptation. Uh, you have somebody like uh, Steven Pinker writing, I think it was in the New York Review of Books or New York Times Magazine about 11 years ago, justifying infanticide because uh, in our hunter-gatherer past, uh, mothers would sometimes kill their infants during times of drought so that they would have more resources, could keep themselves alive so that when uh, uh, the drought was passed and then times of abundance came back, then she could get pregnant again, have a child, and then rear it properly. Uh, and so this was, why did Steven Pinker write this? Because there had been this prom mom, a girl who had gone to a prom, delivered a child and killed it there. So the thing is, evolution is a very mixed bag. You can get some, you can argue for some good things out of it, uh, you know, and you can look at the animal world and you'll see some, some very nice fuzzy things that uh, behave very nicely to each other, and then you'll see some very wicked things. And I think this was actually the problem for Darwin, uh, if you read I mean, he cut his teeth on William Paley's natural theology. The longest chapter in William Paley's natural theology is the second to the last one, in which he's trying to justify the evils in nature. And he tries to really minimize it. He poo-poos it. He says, well, uh, yes, organisms kill each other and they die, but it really happens very quickly and there's not much pain. Darwin takes his voyage on the Beagle, looks at the natural world, and he sees a world of parasites and nastiness. And he says, how could this be? How could a good God design something like this? And you see this mixed bag in nature. Uh, and, uh, and this is actually, I think, a, a challenge for design to make sense of also the nasties. But the thing is, it's a challenge for design, but it's not a refutation of design because we can determine whether something is designed uh, independent of the morality or goodness or optimality of the design. So the issues run very deep, and we're not going to really be able to resolve them here, but I, I do want to give you some sense that, uh, that there is a discussion here and there's some interesting issues and things are also not that pat in terms of trying to understand bonding and the, the good, the feel-good things in our uh, morality and our being simply on the basis of evolution. It's a mixed bag. Whereas, whereas only a few verses away, only a few verses later than the Ten Commandments, uh, God instructs the children of Israel to kill everyone of the other tribe, the Amalekites, the Midianites, everybody, all the men, 
all the children and to leave only the marriageable women alive. That's it. That is, um, and it's a an instruction that's very frequently repeated, by the way, and invariably carried out. Um, when Thomas Paine pointed that out in The Age of Reason a couple of centuries ago, there was a Welsh bishop who wrote in, complaining to him, saying, the Bible does not say those women were kept for immoral purposes. <laughs> you're free to believe that if you wish. If you're going to bring up rape and evolution and the way that humanity actually behaves, under divine instruction, I'm pointing out here, you must stop saying what I meant to correct you from saying earlier, that what I attack is what people do in the name of religion. No, they don't mistake religion when they obey commandments like this. What I object to is what's in the original instructions. And these are instructions for rape, genocide, and slavery. They are instruction manuals for it. And also, how to behave like a slave yourself. Just to come. <clears throat> I want to be careful here because I mean, the, the topic of the debate was the existence and goodness of God. I mean, we, we weren't talking about Christian theism, but I mean, I think uh, here we are at obviously a, a Christian church. So let's talk a little bit about this. I mean, certainly if we're going to do this, we have to get into a little bit of Christian theology. One thing that's very clear is that in Christian theology is that this is a broken, fallen world. And in a broken, fallen world, there are often no good, no optimal solutions. And I think we can see this uh, in, even in human context. Uh, the dropping of the A-bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, difficult decision. Do we do it? We did it. Uh, not to do it means, meant probably losing hundreds of thousands of American lives. Uh, so there was, there was the, the, the problem is that in a fallen world there is no perfect optimization strategy. And it seems to me that God, in dealing with a fallen world, is often confronted with uh, a, uh, uh, trying to get the, the, the best of some bad options. Uh, and I think one thing, you know, the, it's funny that the, the Amalekites keep coming up. The Jews decimated or annihilated them. Uh, but the thing is, the Jews also turned against themselves. They probably fought as much against themselves as they fought against other people, and sometimes in, in divine judgment. Uh, when the, the concubine and judges uh, was dismembered uh, because of this, uh, the, the, the Benjamites, Benjaminites, uh, the, the, almost the entire tribe of Benjamin was destroyed. Uh, God is a just God, and in a sense, he's not bound by the same rules that we are. He makes the rules, and uh, the fact is we all die, and this is, uh, this is a decision by God. I mean, the, the, the way the world is structured, why do we have this death? Why is it a broken and fallen world? Ultimately, Christian the theology teaches that this is a, as a result of human rebellion against God. So you've got this whole system of theology. Now, Christopher Hitchens looks at that, he's aware of it, and you know, he's not going to have a part of it, but there is the whole system that, that you, that, that comes to you and it does the alternatives it seems uh, if you're not going to go with a theistic position a Christian theistic position or some other position maybe you don't find that one right then it seems that you're confronted that with an atheistic position which has its own problems I think uh, the indignation and that that Christopher Hitchens feels and you know the thing is I applaud probably 80 90 percent of his book the the the, the hypocrisies the problems that he finds uh, you know no question about that but on what basis does he do that and I don't think he can do it on an atheist I think often one gets the sense that you know he, he comes in it's hit and run all these faults that he can find problems that he can find with religion but he has an atheistic worldview and that has problems of itself in a fallen world no worldview is going to be perfect it's not going to cover things I mean that's 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 the problem and so we do have a problem with evil we have a problem with good we have lots of problems <laughs> We, we can either go back to questions or you can continue on. Do you, do you have a response to that? Well, in an evolutionary mammalian world, also quite obviously, there is no perfect solution either. As I've said, that's, uh, that, that would, I hardly need to say it once you've described that that's what we are, imperfectly evolved mammals on a short-lived planet. Um, people now object to that, though it's true, and there's all the evidence is in its favor. We are poorly evolved mammals on a short-lived, rather endangered planet. 
Um, people say, well, if you believe that, that's depressing, nihilistic, uh, makes things seem so random and capricious and so on. Well, yes, but is it true or not? And what is true of your view? What is true of your view, sir? Well, you've just said that God invents, makes a human species, takes a brief look at it and decides, it's in rebellion against me. It doesn't know how it's done this, but that's his verdict. You're in rebellion against me. For one thing, you've broken the rule I gave you, don't think for yourselves. You, de you deliberately went and looked for knowledge. Now you're in rebellion. Now you're going to suffer. Now there's nothing that won't happen to you. I made you and I can break you. And I will. I'll flood you, I'll plague you. Now, what is this? This is like being a terrible insect or rodent in the, in the laboratory of a cruel and stupid person. And what could be more, what is more nihilistic? What's more nihilistic and alienating than that? It's all summarized in one line, if you wish. To believe what Dr. Dembski believes and his co-thinkers believe, you have to consider yourself created incurably sick and then ordered on pain of death and eternal torture to be well. This is not morality. Again, we, actually, the, the first question that was asked is the most important question. We could do this question only, couldn't we? But I think we probably should have another one. Yes. Dr. Dempsey, <laughs> would you like to respond before we move on to another question, or we'll save that for the closing? Well, I think, again, we have... The, the, there's a mirror that's, that's at play here. I mean, what poisons everything? Is it religion? I would say get a mirror and look at it. We all poison everything. Uh, we're sick, yes. Uh, but I would say not incurably so. In fact, uh, the, the cure is there, uh, according to Christianity, in Jesus Christ. So it's, uh, so it's not... Uh, and it's interesting, I mean, in a lot of these discussions, Christopher has not brought, brought this up, but I mean, he has a real problem with the vicarious atonement, as he calls it, or substitutionary uh, view of the atonement. Uh, but what's, what's interesting, it seems, it seems that he always omits that in God becoming human in Jesus Christ, that God has established solidarity with the human condition. Uh, this was actually, in my own conversion, the thing that was the turning point. I mean, I was raised in a largely secular home, a uh, biologist father who taught evolutionary biology. And so none of these issues were issues for me, really, the science faith stuff. Uh, what was crucial for me was, did God know what was I, I was going through? Did he have knowledge, not just of description, as this potentate, as this capricious dictator, which you always refer to, off there, but did he know what I was going through in the moment, the, the pain and suffering that I was experiencing, uh, and the fact that Christ had become human. You see, I, I was raised a Roman Catholic. I had no belief that Jesus was God. I remember sitting back at, yeah, I went to a Catholic prep school, six days of school a week, studied Latin and Greek, uh, went to, uh, went to, I remember going to church, and because uh, I was forced to go to church and the Catholic priest saying you cannot be a Christian unless you believe that Jesus was God. And I remember consciously thinking I don't believe this you know and when I was uh, started at the University of Chicago at age 16 I was asked what my religious preference was I put down Hindu because I was a, I was basically a new age guy that's 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 what I was thinking but none of those none of that uh, the, the, the sense I always had that was God was distant and at best he knew what I was dealing with by description, by knowing, by kind of reading a book out of it, by looking from his heaven and seeing what I was, seeing what I was going through from a distance. Missionaries who live in glass houses uh, are not very impressive. Missionaries who go and live with the people and suffer with them, those are the ones who are impressive. Jesus came and lived with us. And not just lived with us, but suffered an excruciating death. Excruciating. I mean, that's a word that comes from crucifixion. It was a word invented because of the pain he went through. So he knows everything that the humans are going through. And that's why he can be a mediator. You know, I mean, from your leftist background, Christopher, you, you know, I mean, the importance of solidarity. And that's what God established with us uh, through Christ coming and through the cross. And so, you know, for you to dismiss 
you know, the, the atonement, at one man, God making union, it's, it's not a capricious dictator. Uh, the, the fact is, dictators go, you know, they capture a country by subversion, by coercion. God owns everything. He created everything. He's the source of all being. And it's not going to be a North Korea in which we uh, you know, are forced to worship God. That's not, the, the thing is, I mean, the, he's the creator of everything. So, I mean, would, wouldn't you want to visit with Shakespeare if you could get a chance? Well, what about visiting with the one who created Shakespeare? I mean, th there's going to be no uh, boredom in heaven because we're a deal. I mean, if, if the earth is exciting, how much more exciting is the one who created everything? So this is the Christian perspective. I think, yeah, you, there, there's harshness there in the scriptures. There are Malachites and a lot of things. But what would you like? Would you like a sanitized Bible in which there was nothing like this, in which we eliminated all of this? Because all the carnage that we see in the scripture is there today. And it's done in the name of religion, and it's done in the name of secular, atheistic principles as well. You know, what poisons everything? We do. Okay. Yeah, we do because we're created sick. But, um, I mean, look, as some of you may or may not know, <clears throat> in the early uh, Christian years, there were many um, leaders of the early church who thought that Christianity should be a new religion. Um, which it's not, unfortunately, for you. And the, other, the reason it'll never triumph um, is because it insists on shackling itself to the terrible books of the Jewish Old Testament. Now, great Christian thinkers like Mar Marcion was the best known. There were Marcionite churches all over the, the M Middle East just for the study and worship of the, me the message of the Nazarene. But it was decided, no, the whole Nazarene story had to prove, had to reverse engineer and prove the truth of the Old Testament books as well. And with this insufferable burden, you've saddled yourself with an unbelievable and wicked religion. Um, it's a pity, I sometimes think. But I think there are deformities to the, the pure Christian religion, too, and he mentioned the name I give to one of them, uh, a doctrine that I think is strictly immoral, the idea of vicarious redemption. Now, though I say I don't think there's any historical definite proof of this person's existence, because all the accounts of him are so discrepant, there are so many of them that it's enough to persuade me that there must have been some such figure. And it's not that unlikely that there'd be a charismatic rabbi wandering in a region that was hungry for messiahs and kept on hoping to find them. It's not at all unlikely that there was one or that he would have got in trouble with the Romans and been, as people were who get in trouble with the Romans, very harshly treated. This does not prove, it doesn't even suggest that his birth was divine or that his father was God or that his mother was a virgin. None of these things are remotely provable. They're not even really arguable. They can only be asserted. But suppose they are. I then have to be told that the torture and human sacrifice of somebody, which if I'd been present, it would have been my duty to try and prevent, which I did not ask for, which I, over which I have no control, that took place thousands of years, according to some, before I was born, commits me, and I have no choice in the matter, and that my sins are forgiven by this human sacrifice. Now, what's wrong with that? If I like you enough or love you enough, I can pay your debt. I say there was a folly on your part, but I'll pay it for you. In extreme cases, people have been known to volunteer to take other people's place in prison, or even, one or two very famous cases, on the scaffold. They'll say, I'll do that for you. I'll do it for love, or I'll do it for suffering humanity. But that's the most they can do. And it's not bad. What they can't do is take away your sins, because that would be to take away your responsibility. I can't say you didn't steal or lose that money that I'm having to pay now. I can't say that this course of folly didn't get you into prison. It did, and now look what you're, do you're doing to me. I can't relieve you of that. I can't wash you white as snow and make you new again. It's more than can be promised and more than should be promised. Vicarious redemption is scapegoating. It's throwing your sins onto an animal. It's an old primitive practice from the Middle East. It doesn't deserve the attention of civilized or thoughtful people. So anyway, it's power. Let's admit, it's kindly offered to me. I give all these objections. I think it's highly implausible. I don't really believe the story. Um, I didn't ask for it. And having considered it, I would rather carry on living, trying to lead a decent life without it. Okay, thanks.
but thanks for asking. Oh no, sorry, you didn't hear us right the first time. It wasn't an offer. You refuse it on pain of death. <clears throat> Excuse me, I won't be talked to in that tone of voice. Something about me. I hope something about some of you too. What was that? I'm not free to refuse this offer. You're making me an offer I can't decline. Was that a threat? Are you saying that if I turn away from this, this lamb's blood, uh, from which I'm supposed to be washed, and say, I don't think it will clean me, say, well, that means an eternity of torture, you know. I hope you, you better take that into account before you uh, consider our offer of eternal love. No, no, no. This is North Korea. This is celestial dictatorship. This is the worship that only a slave could take part in. I'm, I'm happy to respond to this. I think we've, we've only gone through one, one question so far. But let, let me just say this, that you refuse this on pain of death. According to scripture, we're dead already in trespasses of sins. So the only way we're going to find life, I am the resurrection and the life, he that cometh to me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That is God's offer of life. And I, I'm, it's remarkable to me that you identify sins with responsibility. I mean, the, the penal substitution or vicarious atonement, what is it saying? I mean, it's really saying that there's a moral law that all debts must be paid. And that's when you give the examples of, and, and of the uh, person who pays your debt, who serves the prison sentence for you, who dies the death that you deserve, that is what is at stake. That's what, what it means to be forgiven. It means that that debt is paid and that God will not hold you accountable for it because the debt has been paid. Jesus paid the debt. I'm not sure, you know, to bring in responsibility, of course, you did it. And God remembers that you did it, but he's not going to hold it against you. So I'm, and, but the thing is, you know, on atheist principles, what do you mean by responsibility? I mean, you talk to many uh, Darwinists, you're a Darwinist, uh, they will say free will is dead. I mean, something like uh, Will Provine at uh, Cornell. Uh, I mean, free will. I mean, in fact, it's, it's good that free will is gone because then you can't punish people for doing things that they were conditioned to do anyway. But the thing is, if you don't have responsibility, if, if, you, if you don't have free will, you don't have responsibility. Responsibility is the ability to respond, to do differently. And on atheist principles, you don't have responsibility. So, look, I mean, I feel the pressure and the things that you bring up, and I think it, maybe it would be nice if we could just sit around and talk about these things at, at length sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not entirely comfortable with all the theology. You know, I tell my, the my, my students at the seminary, the Bible is not a book of systematic theology. You know, it's nice to have it all laid out and everything is in its neat place. It's, it's messy, and the world is messy, but it captures that messiness. And... I think it offers hope and it offers truth, and I find it does a better job than an atheistic worldview. Does it do a perfect job? No. I wish it did a better job. Hell, I'm not real comfortable with that. Um, the exclusive exclusivity of Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way. Um, you know, I wish sometimes that, uh, you know, that it wasn't quite that harsh a truth, but... You know, that's the thing is, I think with worldviews, often we're stuck with package deals, and I accept it. Uh, but I think we, there, there are tensions that we all deal with, and I, I hope you, you find them in your atheistic worldview, because I don't think it's all neat and pat. And I think in these debates, we sometimes have to pretend that we've got it all down, and I don't think any of us do, really. Please. I, I really think we ought to get... Accommodate another question. Please. Good. A number of the questions actually dealt with um, uh, an area dealing with evolution um, and sort of the beginning, the, the, uh, the concept of uh, what happens before the Big Bang. Where did uh, matter come from? Um, how did we get that? And, uh, and so if you could sort of respond to that from that concept and, and actually if uh, Dr. Dembski in, in, you know, in talking about that same concept um, in dealing with uh, intelligent design, right, where, where are the gaps within the species um, that you've found, right, you know, those species that are, are in between that sort of give a, a problem to the intelligent design concept that sort of demonstrate evolution. Oh, oh, so less, less than three or four minutes. Uh. Yeah, we, we, yeah. <laughs> well, 
Well, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, Christian theology has th certainly taught that, uh, that God created the world from nothing. Nothing in the sense that there is no pre-existing matter, that there's no principle outside God that, that is equally uh, eternal. Uh, and that, that seems to be uh, mirrored in, in the Big Bang because it seems that our physical laws, if we look at the observable universe, not the speculated multiverse, but if we look at the, the observable uh, known physical universe, it seems that when we trace back in time, we get back to some singularity, some point at which we can't push the laws of physics, can't run the, the clocks back any further. So that suggests the beginning. And this was actually a very big issue within the scientific community 30, 40, 50 years ago because when the Big Bang really seemed to be alive and, and the, the way to go in, uh, in our understanding of fu fundamental cosmology, uh, there was the sense that, uh, that, that it opened the door to theism because the, the previous view had been a steady state view in which basically matter, the universe, everything was eternal and uh, there was, uh, had, had basically been unchanged uh, since eternity. So it was a big challenge. Now I think uh, there are lots of moves these days to try to uh, monkey with the cosmology to get a bigger world, a multiverse, but basically that's a way of I think trying to trying to get by the theistic uh, implications of Big Bang cosmology. Uh, with regard to evolution, I don't know, I mean, uh, that, that's, that's just a huge topic. I mean, the, the continuity in the fossil record, uh, I, think the, uh, I think there's a fair amount of uh, common ancestry, but I, I'm certainly not uh, an advocate of uh, universal common ancestry. I just don't think the fossil record bears that out. I think the Cambrian explosion is a, is a perfect example where you have just uh, utter, you, you have these, these forms which are just there, poof, and there are no precursors. And you might say, well, maybe fossilization just wasn't all that good and we missed it. But the thing is, we, we can tell how good fossilization is by looking at extant organisms and seeing how well they're fossilized. And it turns out when you go to higher levels of classifications, families, orders, classes, uh, actually fossilization percentages are very good. So they should be there. And we see also microorganisms, soft body plants in the Precambrian rocks. So it seems to me that uh, the uh, uh, you know, if you're going to try to push for common descent, you're not getting it from the full common, common descent, the monad to man evolution. Uh, I don't think you're, the, 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 the evidence supports that. Mr. Uh, Stephen Hawking's latest book on um, <clears throat> the Big Bang, the first one in which he actually says explicitly that it, it all works without God, in fact, works better without the idea of a, of a creator, contains a, a statement with which I hugely want to disagree. He says that these latest discoveries in physics <clears throat> are also the death of philosophy. I don't want that to be true because I'm not a scientist and I revere philosophy. Uh, but what he means by it is this. There was a time when a philosopher, a natural philosopher, someone like uh, Newton um, or Kant, um, could speculate about the natural world. That's why they were called natural scientists as well. And do better <clears throat> than many professionals could. For example, it was Kant sitting in a room in Königsberg after the Lisbon earthquake when people for the first time began to doubt that earthquakes were caused by God or were judgments. This is only in the 18th century people began for the first time to wonder if these were verdicts as the Christians had been telling them. Didn't seem to work anymore. Kant proposed the idea, it may seem fanciful, but perhaps there are underground caverns, some of them even below the sea, which sometimes cave in and lead to what he didn't call seismic events, because we didn't have a word for seismology then. But there were, philosophers could do scientific work by speculating on the natural world and using their heads, uh, as Lucretius could with the atoms. What Hawking means to say is this, we now may be beyond the point where you can say anything useful unless you are in fact a member of a certain scientific discipline. I really hope this isn't true for selfish reasons, but you have to take this thought very seriously. Now, Lawrence Krauss, who I think is one of the greatest living physicists, has a, a, a lecture which you can go to YouTube and have a look at. Called, it's called A Whole Universe from Nothing. He explains how it is, how with the what we now know about the quantum, which is perilously little, by the way, so far, but what we know about it, can claim to know, suggests that actually nothing from nothing isn't as much of a contradiction as it may seem. And that's about the origins of the matter. 
<clears throat> I'd recommend that to you. I, my only f philosophical contribution, if you like, would be towards the end of the question, which is a little easier, I think. Whether we came from nothing or not, we are certainly headed for it or it is headed for us. You may choose to believe that this tiny speck of a planet in a, in a bang which blows out a million sun, a, a sun every second, sorry, a whole sun every second and has done for 10 billion years, that all that happened so that we could be meeting here today, you can choose to believe that if you want to. It's just, it's not even disproportionate. It's, it's, it's simply refusing to use the new language and the new evidence as if they meant anything at all. But suppose that to be true if you wish, if you must. If you look in the sky, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy heading towards us now. We know, physicists can tell you, the date on which our galaxy will collide with Andromeda. It's actually, it can be seen with the naked eye, the future. It's over. We don't know whether that will happen first or whether our sun will join the billions of suns that have blown up or whether, <clears throat> now that we've discovered, discovered that Edwin Hubble's red light shift showing the speed and rate of the expansion of the universe, the way in which it's flying apart. And as I said earlier, that speed and rate, this was only found out a decade ago, is increasing all the time, completely contradicting everything we thought before. We're flying apart faster than we thought. A lot of nothingness is coming our way. Now, what design is that a part of, is what you have to ask yourself. Of what design, let alone of what benign design, could that conceivably be a part? This fantastic waste of energy, this gigantic profusion. Again, it makes God such a tinkerer and such a profligate, just as 99.8% of every species created on Earth since it started has been dispensed with, has gone extinct, has been surplus to requirements. What a waste, what a, what a profusion, what a cruelty if you want to give it human or a spirited name. Ah, that's what you have to believe. That's the kind of tinkerer, the kind of capricious, uh, incompetent tyrant, obviously so much model on our human experience of authority. As, as it's enough to convince me of what I'm now sure of. Man did not create God. Men and women created many, many, many gods and always have since the dawn of our history and still do. And one of those gods may be true, out of all of them, might be real, or all of them could be false, or all of them could be true. And the overwhelming probability, it seems to me, as the cults that attach to each other, is that all of them are false and for the same reason, they are made up by creatures half a chromosome away from being chimpanzees, and I'm afraid to say it shows. Thank you. Can I respond? Mm. Well, we have to move on. I, I know we could, uh, we could uh, continue uh, to go back and forth for quite a while, and I appreciate you guys. Um, as opposed to getting to all the questions, you actually answered a lot of the questions that we had uh, just by going back and forth. So we're going we're gonna to actually end up uh, closing with just our final statements, uh, five-minute final statements. And uh, no agreement. I, don't, I mean, I haven't thought of it till now. I'd rather have another question than summarize what I've already said. Would you like to ask each other a question? I'd rather give the audience, I mean, I feel we shortchange the... Uh, but you may want to do your closing one, and I've, I don't blame I've you. got my closer, I mean, I have a prepared text, and I'm hoping it's going to be a zinger, so... Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess in the, in the sake of the interest of, uh, of the people in the audience that we have here, I know many of the schools um, are going to have to get back. We'll, uh, we'll simply... Um, I, I will say that out of the questions that we did have, you did answer a number of the questions, even though we didn't get to verbalize them specifically. So, uh, Mr. Hitchens, if you'd like to have five minutes for closing. Not really. I'd rather have a question. Fantastic. <laughs> I might take five minutes to answer it, but I'd rather, I feel more, I feel suddenly combative and engaged. <laughs> How about this? If you don't think I can talk for five minutes at the drop of a hat, by the way, you mistake me. Yeah. I can We'll, we'll allow Dr. Dembski to have five minutes, and okay. if there's anything you'd like to respond to in that, if there's a question, maybe that will give me something. <laughs> Fantastic, Dr. Dembski. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that the the old Christopher Hitchens seems back in, in fighting form. So this is this is good. Uh, 
got to keep things interesting. Okay, well, let me uh, give you my closing statement. Uh, in Alexander Schmemann's critique of secularism, he remarked, quote, it is not the immor immorality of the crimes of man that reveal him as a fallen being. It is his positive ideal, religious or secular, and his satisfaction with this ideal. Let me read that again. It is not the immorality of the crimes of man that reveal him as a fallen being. It is his positive ideal, religious or secular, and his satisfaction with this ideal, close quote. A common criminal knows that he is a criminal and doesn't try to rationalize his crimes or cast himself as a benefactor of humanity. But an ideologue who knows what's best for humanity and cannot find satisfaction until everyone is on board with his positive ideal, with his ideology, such a man can rationalize anything and is truly dangerous. Schmemann's insight captures what's right and what's wrong with Christopher Hitchens' case against religion. Religion can be a problem, yes. Religious people confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Hitchens sees this clearly, but secularism can be as guilty as religion in this respect. Secularists confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have likewise felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Nevertheless, Hitchens refuses to admit any parity between religious and secular evil. Recount atrocities committed by religious people and Hitchens is delighted, yet another nail in the coffin of religion. But mention a person, community, or movement whose atrocities flow from their secular ideals and Hitchens changes the subject. And to what subject does he change it? Why, to religion, of course. For instance, mention Stalin and the millions he killed and Hitchens will tell you how Stalin started out as a seminarian for the Orthodox priesthood and how Russian Orthodox believers presently make icons of Stalin, complete with halos. Mention the Nazis, the Holocaust, and Hitler. Hitler, by the way, likened Christianity to smallpox. And Hitchens will regale you with how many SS were churchgoers. Mention North Korea and its crazy communist dictators. And Hitchens will inform you that the North Korea is the closest thing he can imagine to the Christian heaven, complete with a holy trinity comprising Kim this, Kim that, and Kim something else. Uh, Changing the subject in this way, however, doesn't change the fact that secularism can be just as ideologically driven as religion. The irony is that Hitchens' own atheist crusade is itself ideologically driven. The subtitle of Hitchens' book reads, How Religion Poisons Everything. Gripped by the idea that religion poisons everything, he cannot allow that religious people, precisely because of their religion, might do good. Hitchens takes this idea to ridiculous extremes in his attack on Mother Teresa. In his 1994 BBC documentary, Hell's Angel, his 1995 book, The Missionary Position, and briefly, in God is Not Great, Hitchens portrays her as a self-serving hypocrite. In the audience today is my good friend, Mary Poplin, a professor at Claremont. She was in Calcutta with Mother Teresa when Hitchens came out with his book against her. Recently, Poplin published Finding Calcutta, in which she recounts her time with Mother Teresa. Poplin writes, quote, and Poplin and the nuns there were reading your, your book while she was there. Hitchens also accused Mother Teresa of receiving the best in health care when it was not available to the poor. However, I took an offer to her from a colleague's brother who was involved in developing a new pacemaker to replace her old pacemaker with new, a new and improved one. She said she could not accept it, but she would accept it for the poor. She also refused another medical offer. When I called and repeated these offers upon her becoming more ill a few months after I left, and that was close to her death, she again refused and asked for prayers instead. My impression is that she mostly received good health care when she was too ill to fight it. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it there rather abruptly. I think in my rhetoric course, I, I would wrap things up. but. Um, uh, I'm going to give Mother Teresa the last word, so that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> oh, well. Well, Mother Teresa was a fanatic, um, a fundamentalist, and a fraud. She was not a friend of the poor, as she claimed to be. She was a friend of poverty. Preached it as a, as a good thing, as a gift from God, something to be welcomed along with other kinds of 
suffering, wasn't interested in alleviating it, was a friend of the rich, took money from the Duvalier family in Haiti, one of the most obscenely bloated uh, dynastic dictatorships in history, uh, took money from Charles Keating, the man who robbed Americans blind through the Lincoln Savings and Loan, stolen money, um, all to build convents in her own name, uh, more than 200 of them around the world, in order to found an order that bear, bore her name. This is not modesty either, nor is it humility. It doesn't exhaust my critique of her either. Um, we all know there is a cure for poverty. It's a rudimentary one. It does work, though. It works everywhere for the same reason. It's colloquially called the empowerment of women. It's the only thing that does work. If you allow women control over, some control over their cycle of reproduction, so that they're not chained by their husbands or by village custom to annual animal type pregnancies, early death, disease, and so on. If you will free them from that, give them some basic uh, health of that sort, and if you're generous enough to throw in perhaps a handful of seeds and a bit of credit, the whole floor, culturally, socially, medically, uh, economic of that village will rise. It works every time. Mother Teresa spent her entire life campaigning against that outcome. She said that contraception was equivalent to abortion morally, and abortion was morally equivalent to murder. She was entirely against the only thing that cures poverty. I would say that her preachments led to an enormous increase in the amount of poverty, ignorance, filth, and disease in the world. And I would further add, without embarrassment, that it's off those things that the Roman Catholic Church has always fed and made its living. Otherwise, there'd be no need for the Protestant Revolution which brings us here today. Um, and believe me, I've, I've barely started with, uh, with that terrible person. Now, as I said before, you can be an atheist in anything you like. You can be an atheist in the Marquis de Sade. You can be an atheist and be uh, a great humanist. I mean, most of the uh, missionary work, people d work done by Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, by Oxfam, by many other people in the stricken parts of the globe which I've visited, done by people who are not doing it to proselytize for their faith. They're not doing it handing out Bibles surreptitiously. They're not doing it for any, for any such reason. They're doing it for its own sake. That's a, that's a beautiful humanism, and I admire it. I even think it has a slight superiority, and there's no hidden agenda to it. But I'm not going to have Nazism called secularism, if you don't mind. Uh, it, I'm a prisoner of what I know here. I know too much about it. I've read Mein Kampf, for example, which most people have not, where Hitler says several times, starting very early on, that he's doing God's work in exterminating the Jews. He went on saying that. The Vatican was shown the book. In those days, they would ban any book they didn't like the look of. They were one of the great book banning organizations in the world. They didn't ban the book that was written by the leader who made his first political treaty in Germany with them and their church and outside Germany between his dictatorship and the Vatican. If you wanted to take your oath, well, you didn't have to want to, you had to, if you were in the German army or in the SS, to take your oath to the Fuhrer, which was compulsory, you took it like this, I swear by Almighty God, undying fealty. Around your belt, if you were a soldier in the Nazi army, you had to wear a buckle that said, Gott mit uns, the German for God, on our side. Uh, like every other form of totalitarianism, and fanaticism. This is religious in itself, and it was not, it was not as it was in some other countries, the Christian right in power, but it was the Christian right subsumed into a party that involved various other terrible mutations too. So I just have to defend myself, it seems to me, on these two uh, matters. I'll close on the implied question that Bill asked me earlier. Why don't you accept this wonderful offer? <clears throat> Why wouldn't you like to meet Shakespeare, for example? I mean, I don't know if you really think that when you die you can be corporeally reassembled and have conversations with authors from previous epochs. It's not necessary that you believe that in Christian theology, and I have to say it sounds like a complete fairy tale to me. The only reason I want to meet Shakespeare, or might even want to, is because I can meet him any time, because he is immortal in the works he's left behind. If you've read those, meeting the author would almost certainly be a disappointment. But when Socrates was sentenced to death for his philosophical investigations and for blasphemy, for challenging the gods of the city, and he accepted his death, he did say, well, 
if we are lucky, perhaps I'll be able to hold conversation with other great thinkers and philosophers and doubters too. In other words, that the discussion about what is good, what is beautiful, what is noble, what is pure and what is true could always go on. Why is that important? Why would I like to do that? Because that's the only conversation worth having. And whether it goes on or not after I die, I don't know. But I do know that it's the conversation I want to have while I'm still alive. Which means that to me, the offer of certainty, the offer of complete security, the offer of an impermeable faith that can't give way, is an offer of something not worth having. I want to live my life taking the risk all the time that I don't know anything like enough yet, that I haven't understood enough, that I can't know enough, that I'm always hungrily operating on the, on the margins of, of a potentially great harvest of future knowledge and wisdom. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'd urge you to look at those of you who tell you, those people who tell you at your age that you're dead till you believe as they do. What a terrible thing to be telling to children. And that you can only live. And that you can only live by accepting an absolute authority. Don't think of that as a gift. Think of it as a, think of it as a poison chalice. Push it aside, however tempting it is. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. Please uh, thank both of our guests, Dr. Dembski, Mr. Hitchens. Thank you. Yes, yes. Where was I before? For those of you who don't know, um, Mr. Hitchens did make a reference uh, to his condition, um, and uh, one of the reasons that he's not going to stay with us afterwards here uh, is he's going to uh, make an appointment back at uh, the airport before he flies back home. But uh, I will say that he had a double shot of espresso beforehand, and uh, boy, that I tell you, it sure can give you some energy regardless of what condition you're in. So we appreciate him um, for coming out, and uh, we appreciate Dr. Dembski for coming up and uh, sharing both of the thoughts. Um, we do have a, a, a great opportunity uh, for continuing the conversation, uh, not only here at our school, but uh, there's a great organization here in town called Probe Ministries. Uh, Kirby Ander Anderson heads that up, and uh, uh, Ray and Sue Bolin, and uh, some good friends of ours that uh, if you still have questions and you want to get answers, um, I would suggest uh, Probe Ministries is a wonderful place to go. Um, but uh, uh, I think both of our speakers would say uh, the more well-read you are, uh, the more questions you're going to have and the more answers you're going to find. So we appreciate them. Uh, Dr. Dembski is going to be staying with us uh, for a few minutes afterwards. And uh, the college at Southwestern has a little booth out there. Our good friend Steve Smith uh, heads that up, and we'd love for you to stop by and say hi to him as well. Uh, for our particular school, before we dismiss, uh, just to let you know, upper school, you're going to advisory. Middle school, you're going to lunch. Um, and uh, so we'll be making our way out there. But uh, to uh, close us in uh, prayer, I know Dr. Taylor, Dr. Larry Taylor, our head of school, is going to come up and finish us up for the evening, or for the day. Thank you. I personally want to thank uh, Mr. Hitchens and Dr. Dembski, and uh, I know some of you have to get going, but if you could just pause for a second. You know, today we had a debate. Uh, we had some of the great thinkers in our world with us, and I think one of the positive things as an academician is that we prove today that different people with different worldviews can actually join together in civility and talk about their ideas. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. Thank you, Dr. Dembski. I'd like to close in a word of prayer, but I want to say this before I pray. Since 1978, I have been reading and, and listening and, and studying. Uh, I think the two great thinkers today have uh, also concluded that for the next extra period of time, how many years we live, uh, they don't have all the answers. And Mr. Hitchens 
doesn't have all the answers. Dr. Dembski doesn't have all the answers. And I know, as I said over there, confused with half of the discussion, I don't have all the answers. But since 1978, I have not been persuaded by the atheist worldview. I have been persuaded by the truth that's in God's Word. And it's to that God. And it is to that God that I'd like to pray. Father, thank you that you confuse us all. Father, uh, it, it is confusing to, to just live today and, and even to listen to the last hour, hour and a half. It is confusing. But God, thank you that you uh, set an example. Father, thank you that we don't have to aimlessly walk on this earth. Thank you that you left a script, a book, that has truth. And Lord, thank you that it's through that book that I personally met you. And Father, I am grateful for the sacrifice through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I look forward to spending eternity with you. Thank you for our guest. Thank you that we can join together, even though we disagree. Father, thank you that we can have a cup of coffee together. Thank you that through your love and your power, that you transcend even our differences. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.